water measure, uh, you know, but I mean, talking about like the heat is the deal he owned that deal down there in the, in the big bend, bunch of land. But, and then in 85, I left him and been on my own, doing my own thing, developing. And now I've, I've quit doing my own stuff, my money, finance and stuff. I'm doing what we call fee. Good evening, everyone. Uh, Chair, it is now 6.30 and you may start the meeting. All right, thank you very much. I now call the October 22nd, 2020 meeting of the Sugar Land Planning and Zoning Commission to order. Item number one is recognition. Recognize Carl Huebner and Carl, Kathy Huebner and Carl Stevens for their years of service on the Planning and Zoning Commission. We are honored to have with us this evening, Mayor Joe Zimmerman and Lisa Kostich Meyer, Director of Planning and Development Services. Mayor, your pleasure. Uh, thank you, Matt. Hey, I wanted to, uh, one, recognize Matt, you, congratulate you on being appointed chair, congratulate Dan on being the vice chair. But I also wanted to recognize two people that have made an extraordinary contribution to the city of Sugarland. Kathy Heavner served on the Planning and Zoning Commission for 18 years. Carl Stevens has served 15 years on the commission. When, you know, I thought I was doing good. I served, I, I served eight years. So I wanted to recognize, I know Kathy couldn't be with us tonight. Kathy served with me. I came in in 2000. She was there in 1998, finished her first service in 2006. We asked her to come back in 2010, another 10 years to 2020, uh, with her chair role being for 10 years. That's, that's really extraordinary. Carl, who's with us tonight, served with me from 2005 to when I went out in 2008, but he's been on the commission since 2005 to 2020, 15 extraordinary years. He's a developer. He brought an absolutely unique perspective to the planning and zoning commission, a very detailed guy. Uh, some of the comments and stuff that he found on plats, I mean, I could only dream of coming up with, and I was a developer too. So, you know, I wanted to recognize personally, Carl and Kathy, Carl, you know, for you, you and I have known each other for a long, long time. He served on the developers council of the GHBA. He was with Walter Misher for a number of years. He's had his own company now for what Carl's been, I guess, 20 years. He's still active in land development. And I wanted to say to Carl from me to you, thank you very much for your service. It's, you know, people like you and Kathy that make Sugarland what it is, your willingness to volunteer your time, give up your time to make our city great. So I want to thank you. Well, thank you, Joe. I appreciate your thoughts. Buddy, they're going to tell me to sign off. So Lisa, I guess I'm going to, I'm going to let, uh, I'm going to turn it over to you, Matt, Dan, congratulations. Uh, Thank you guys for stepping up and uh, we look forward to uh, great things to come from both of you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you and, for joining and, us this evening. Go ahead, Lisa. Yeah, and, 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 and Chair and, and uh, Mayor and, and Carl, I know I know we just got through talking and reminiscing, but I just wanted to say thank you. And I know Kathy couldn't be here unexpectedly um, due, to, due to work, but she did want to um, send along uh, her congratulations to the new commissioners and to those that are stepping into the chair and vice chair role. And she really wanted to send thanks to, to all of you. So um, I know she couldn't be here, but uh, she wanted to at least pass that along. And uh, we will be doing a more formal recognition, um, hopefully at the November, um, a November city council meeting. And so we'll make sure that we um, send details out. But Carl, thank you for all of your time. I think the mayor said it best, I mean, your time and Kathy's time on the, on the commission has been really unprecedented and extraordinary and just want to really thank you. I think um, all of the time that you spent um, preparing for meetings, um, attending meetings, and some that have been really, really long into the wee hours of, of the night um, in the morning, I guess, um, I think uh, the contributions that you both have, have made 
um, have left a mark on the city for the better. And I think um, everyone that visits here, lives here, works here, um, really will benefit from, from all of your contributions. So thank you, Carl. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks for your thoughts. Carl, thank you, thank you buddy. Carl, we're really going to have to step up our game now uh, with you leaving, uh, you and Kathy both. Uh, uh, I'm going to have to learn how to agitate the staff like you do. So, uh, <laughs> well, well, enjoy your Tuesdays and Thursdays off. Thank you. Thank I want you. I want to share one comment or one situation. I was reminiscing with Lisa a little earlier. I can't remember when it was. I don't know. Sometime in the past year, obviously. In fact, when it was still Ruth Lomer was still <clears throat> making presentation. <clears throat> uh, you know, for plant or whatever. And so that night, as Kathy always did, or went around the diocese, you know, or us with a podium up there with everybody. And, and it got to me and uh, she asked me, I had any, any comments? And I said, no, I don't have any comments. And I never will forget, Ruth just burst out into laughter and just, you know, gosh, you know, and I wanted to ask her, then I never did. I wanted to say, you know, Ruth, did you win the pot? Because Carl's that's the first one that Carl never made a comment. <laughs> <laughs> we should have bet on that. <laughs> <laughs> so anyhow, I, I, I never will forget that, Ruth. <laughs> anyway. Glad I could make you laugh. <laughs> <laughs> Well, well, Carl, tonight will probably be only the second time then that you haven't had questions for city staff at a presentation. So that's that's also going to be a record. So, yeah. um, and and I, I would just add briefly, if I may, uh, you know, I certainly I don't think I could add much color to the mayor's comments or to Lisa's. I've been on planning zoning commission for a few years now and had the pleasure of serving with both Carl and Kathy. And I will just tell you, I, personally, I, I don't know how we're going to replace you. I think Jay's right. We're all going to have to step up our game considerably, considerably. to bring the to bring the insight, um, really to brush up a lot on in history on a lot of these matters, but to bring the insight uh, and the attention to detail and the creativity of the position. Um, we really are losing two very valued voices on the committee. So I'm personally grateful to you. I'm personally grateful for the opportunity to be able to serve with you. Uh, and we will all up our game, but we're going to have to. Um, and in that same vein, I'd like to welcome uh, Tim Hart and Chuck Brown, our two newest commissioners. And uh, welcome to the Planning and Zoning Commission. Uh, we've all got big shoes to fill. Uh, and I look forward to working with you in that regard. But, you know, I. I I just couldn't be more grateful, Carl, to you and Kathy for your service to this commission. So thank you. Thank you, Matt. That's the very kind word. I appreciate that. Thank you. All right. Any other comments or remembrances? All right. Well, all right. Thank you, Carl. We look forward to we look forward to celebrating with you in person uh, as soon as the law allows it. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Carl. Thank you all. It was nice serving with all everybody on the commission. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Car you, Carl. Carl, before you leave, we have your nameplate, and I'll come and bring it to you. Okay. I'll, I'll come right. after uh, after we vote for minutes. <laughs> all right. Absolutely. Well, we will do. Uh, let's move on. To, we'll do that shortly. I guess we'll move on right now to item three public comment a citizen who desire to address the commission with regard to matters on the agenda other than the public hearing will be read at this time members of the public desiring to make comments during this portion of the meeting will be allowed to submit their written comments to the office of city secretary written and emailed comments must be received by 3 p.m thursday october 22nd the city of sugarland reserves the right to remove any written or emailed comments deemed inappropriate as outlined above and or related to matters posted on the agenda. Comments or discussion by the board will only be made at the time the subject is scheduled for consideration. Uh, did we have anyone sign up for public comment? No, sir. All right, then we will move on to item four, which is a 4A, consideration and action on the minutes of the September 24, 2020 meeting. Has everyone had a chance to review? or have any changes. 
Move to approve. Was that you, Commissioner Simeon? Yes, it was. was. We have a motion to approve the minutes. Is there a second? I'll, I'll second to approve. We have a second from Commissioner K9. Uh, any other, if there's no other discussion, let's vote at this time. I'm having trouble with my screen, guys. My apologies. Commissioner Brown. Can we have Commissioner Brown vote by hand? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, that's an aye. All right, is that sufficient? Yeah. Yes, All thank right. you. All right, it passes unanimously among the members present. Uh, item 5A, review of and discussion on Planning and Zoning Commission roles and responsibilities. Lisa Kochich Meyer, Director of Planning and Development Services, Doug Schomburg, City Planner for Development Planning, Ruth Lommer, City Planner Long Range, Lauren Fair, Principal Planner, and Shay Smith, Assistant City Attorney. Take it away. Okay, good evening, Commissioners. So, ooh, let me go back a couple of slides. There you go. So this um this is your annual orientation and per council policy that they've established, um, we as staff liaisons to the Planning and Zoning Commission um, are to give you an annual orientation. So in this workshop, we're gonna cover your roles, responsibilities, um, as well as any attendance requirements. We're gonna go through various authorities um, and responsibilities that you have under state law, uh, city charter and city codes. We're gonna touch on your policies and rules of procedure. Uh, we're going to cover any materials or topics that are relevant to the, the types of cases and work that comes before the commission. Uh, we're also going to do a look ahead at some of the uh, work plan items that are coming up in uh, fiscal year 2021 for you. And we are also going to, um, Shay is going to join us and we'll cover any legal considerations uh, such as Open Meetings Act, conflicts of interest, and some disclosure. So next slide. We have a lot of slides, so I'm gonna to try to move through this. At any time, if you have questions, please uh, feel free. Um, we'll also have time at the end of kind of each of our sections. Um, and of course, we can always uh, do a deeper dive into any of these topics in, in another uh, meeting if, uh, if if the commission would like. Um, just to highlight um, for you, the commission, this is an appointed board um, by the city council. You serve in two year staggered terms. Um, the commission is authorized under state law. Um, cities are au authorized to appoint a zoning commission to exercise uh, zoning powers, powers that are granted uh, to cities in Texas. Uh, also in the city charter, um, it also establishes, a, establishes and creates the planning and zoning commission for the city. Um, it sets the terms that you serve, establishes again, your duties and responsibilities, which include uh, performing uh, recommendations um, to the city council, as well as uh, being the final authority for subdivision platting in the city, MBTJ. And then you also, um, through the Sugarland uh, Code of Ordinances, um, there are also responsibilities established. So next slide, and we'll touch on the Code of Ordinances. Um, which includes the commission um, as in the category as an administrative board. So you have some final decision-making authority specifically related to plats. Again, it also touches on your terms um, and also further defines how the chair and vice chair are appointed by the city council and the mayor. Um, it also establishes uh, your attendance expectations, which we'll go over in a bit. It also outlines uh, the expectations for how you vote and how you comply with um, any conflicts of interest provisions that are set by state law, which uh, Shay will go over. And then it also specifies that you are a body that serves without compensation. Um, and so you are not paid, this is a volunteer uh, role. It also specifies that uh, you may not hold another public office um, that has authority within the city or ETJ. Next slide. 
So specifically looking at state law and what sections of the Texas Local Government Code really apply to the work that comes before or that we look to for guidance for the work that comes before uh, the Commission. There are three key areas that are applicable to the Commission. Uh, those include chapters 211, 212, and 213. They focus on uh, zoning regulations, uh, the subdivision regulations, as well as comprehensive planning. And we're going to touch on these um, further throughout the presentation. Next slide. Specifically for your attendance, um, all members are expected to be available and attend uh, all meetings, if not most meetings, um, if possible. Um, if for some reason a member is unable to attend uh, meetings, then um, that member should uh, submit their resignation so a, a replacement can be found and appointed uh, for the position. Um, likewise, if for some reason uh, a member misses three consecutive meetings, then um, by just by nature of missing the meetings, three meetings consecutively, um, you um, have rendered your position and resignation and um, a replacement will be found. Next slide. Um, so touched on this a little bit before, but again, for the duties and responsibilities of the commission, two primary roles, you uh, take action, whether that's approving, approving with conditions or disapproving uh, with reasons, subdivision plats, um, as provided by state law and within uh, compliance with city ordinance. You also serve in a recommending role to city council. Um, so recommending approval or um, denial of proposed changes to the zoning regulations found in the development code or changes to the zoning map. So whether that be rezonings or conditional use permits, those are items that you recommend um, to the city council for final, who has the final authority or approval. Uh, you also review and make recommendations on city master plans. Uh, typically they come forward to you in the form of updates that we do periodically. You will also annually review uh, the city's five-year capital improvements plan and make a recommendation on that to city council. And there may be other periodic um, duties um, that are directed your way by city council or by ordinances that are approved. Next slide. So again, your role in uh, plat approval um, or denial is, is a very limited um, focus or limited discretion. Um, the development code outlines what is required and if an, um, a plat is brought before you and it meets all of the requirements of the code, then it is uh, deemed to be approved if it meets all of the state law and development code. Um, any conditions, um, and this is a change that was uh, most recent through state law, but any conditions of approval or reasons for denying uh, must be cited, uh, must, must cite the code requirements, and they must be documented as part of the official motion and uh, communication back to the applicant. Next slide. One of the things that we find important um, in your recommending role to city council is that you keep uh, the long range goals and objectives um, in mind as you are making recommendations. And that is mainly seen in the vision uh, that is established uh, by city council through their various um, documents, such as the comprehensive plan and other master plans. Uh, you also have a unique role in that you represent uh, community values and uh, community perspective, as all of you are uh, residents of the community as well. Um, but you also have a special charge in listening to the public input and public comments um, on cases and items that come before you. Um, so keeping those in mind as you're making recommendations uh, to City Council is also very important. Um, as you make your recommendations, it's important to be objective and be consistent so that like um, requests are treated similar um, to um, or across the board. Next slide. So one, it's uh, typically also touch on uh, training and education. So again, per city council policy, uh, you are to receive an annual orientation so we can check that one off. But the Planning and Zoning Commission is also unique in that uh, City Council has specified that you um, be provided additional training and educational opportunities. So typically that is completed or addressed through the um, Texas chapter of the American Planning Association's annual conference. However, if, um, you know, if 
someone can't attend, we also look for some other comparable conferences um, or some other programs that might be offered by uh, accredited universities and, and programs. Um, next year, um, it's hard to believe, but um, the Texas APA conference um, is, I guess, tentatively scheduled to be in Fort Worth. I know this year it was a um, very unique opportunity that I'm glad several of you were able to uh, take part in. Um, and I'll be touching a little bit more on that a little bit later in, in our work plan. Um, but it's highly encouraged that you all um, plan to attend uh, the conference. Um, and of course, if there are other topics, um, whether it's a really unique case that's coming before the board, or if there are other topics that you're interested in or want to do a little bit of a deeper dive in, always happy to uh, schedule additional training, whether one-on-one -on -one or in, uh, for the full commission. So just reach out to us and let us know. Next slide. Okay, I wanted to touch on this a little bit as well, kind of in the staff role, um, especially for our for our newer members. Um, um, but uh, the Planning and Development Services Department serves as your liaison and staff support um, to the commission. So we have professional staff, um, planning staff um, that advise the commission, we prepare case materials, uh, we coordinate um, public hearings and any of the public input that is received throughout um, in the public process. We also coordinate with um, our other city staff and other departments and prepare some of the administrative items such as um, such as your packets and uh, preparing materials for meetings. So I want to note that uh, amongst our staff, we have five accredited planners on staff. And so that really, I think, is um, really indicative of the, the talent and expertise that we have on staff. and. Um, we hope that our few others um, can join us in the accredited um, category as well over the coming years. But I think this may be one of the first times we have as many as five um, accredited planners on staff. So that's a real I think, achievement for, for the city. Um, the engineering department also plays a role um, assisting with technical information. Uh, they also play a part in, in technical reviews of TIAs or some of the other civil um, type um, plans that accompany a lot of the um, development projects that are moving through um, the city process. And of course, they also make recommendations on those items. Um, so we're kind of behind the scenes. We're providing uh, citizen support um, and support to the development community, providing them information assistance to kind of shepherd them through the development process. Overall, we kind of wear a facilitation um, hat um, as we kind of facilitate all the planning efforts and provide uh, technical recommendations to, to you, the commission. Next slide. So I know that's a really quick um, overview, but we're going to do a deeper dive in, in a lot of these elements uh, throughout the rest of the presentation. So I'm going to turn it over to Ruth Bomer. She's going to walk you through the comprehensive plan and master planning. All right, thanks Lisa. Good evening, commissioners. I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about um, the comprehensive plan and the master plans, kind of the long range planning element um, for the city. So the Texas Local Government Code, our um, statutes outline um, our ability to do comprehensive planning and zoning. In Texas, um, having a comprehensive plan for a city is optional. That's different than in some other states. Zoning is also optional. As you may know, our big brother up the street does not have zoning. Um, but the, the statutes do say that if you have zoning um, as a city, then you also have to have a comprehensive plan. And if you have a comprehensive plan, you have to follow it. Next slide. Um, so what is a comprehensive plan? It documents where we are and then really ultimately where we wanna be, where we wanna go as a city, that broader vision. Um, it's a physical plan um, that shows where and how we want to grow. It's long range, so it's looking at kind of build out of the city and the ETJ. It's comprehensive in that it involves all aspects of the city, um, several different um, areas like transportation and, and utilities and things like that. And um, it provides policy guidance and direction um, and it guides master plans, um, which we'll talk about in the next slide. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, so the comprehensive plan was last adopted in July of 2012. This was chapters one through five, which included um, the census and demographics information at the time. And then it also included council's adopted vision 2025 as goals A through K. And then we followed up with an update to chapter six, which is the land use plan. Um, and it was adopted in August of 2018. Next slide. 
Oops, one more back, please. Okay, there we go. Um, so these are the, the goals A through K and that are in the comprehensive plan. They range from safe community to beautiful community, superior mobility, balanced development and redevelopment and kind of everything in between. So it really touches on a really broad variety of topics. Um, and there are objectives that are associated with each of these. Next slide. Um, so as I mentioned, in 2018, we adopted an update to the land use plan, which includes the um, future land use map, which you can see here. And it um, that update was focused primarily on addressing redevelopment, multifamily, and looking at the remaining vacant areas that are in the city. Since we are largely a built out city, our focus was really on kind of those last few remaining areas and then how we were going to redevelop in the future. Um, so the 2018 future land use map included some new land use categories, including um, mixed use areas, the regional activity centers and neighborhood activity centers, which I'm actually going to talk about some more a little bit later, and then um, some company town neighborhoods, which again will come up later. Next slide. Um, so these are the goals that were established with the land use plan. Um, the first one being preserving single family neighborhoods. It talks about creating mixed use activity centers having in, inviting outdoor spaces, and, and then in the end, um, finally celebrating Sugar Land. Next slide. <clears throat> so um, that is the comprehensive plan. And then we have eight master plans, which are elements of the comprehensive plan. And they are basically um, the certain um, subject area really going into detail for um, each of them. Um, and so we have the, the land use plan, which I just mentioned. We also have the pedestrian and bicycle master plan, municipal facilities master plan, the wastewater, drainage, water, parks, recreation, open space, and the thoroughfare master plan. Um, and so I've highlighted a couple of those there that are um, currently underway um, of, of undergoing updates. Um, and so we'll talk about that when um, we get to the, the work plan element. Next slide. So each year we provide a um, master plan annual report. This is something where we go through, um, we work with the owning departments of each of the master plans to document the progress of their master plans. Um, it also identifies the timing of the next update. Um, we generally update them every seven to 10 years, but um, want to make sure that we're, we're updating them when um, the policies don't make sense anymore or when a lot of the projects have been completed and they're almost wrapped up. Um, it also helps us make the connection between um, the master plans and the capital improvement program each year. Um, and so there are CIP projects that often result directly from um, projects that are identified in master plans. Um, and so we'll actually be presenting the master plan and a report to the Planning and Zoning Commission at your next PNZ meeting. So you'll get to hear about how, um, how we're doing this year. Next slide. With that, I'm gonna actually, does anybody have any questions before I hand it over to them? Ruth, um, aren't we combining a couple of master plans into one, the transportation, bicycle, what's... We are, we are, and I'm going to get into that a little bit later, but yes, so the okay. pedestrian and bicycle master plan and the thoroughfare plan, and then um, the comprehensive mobility plan, which is not an official master plan, but kind of looks like one, um, is getting combined in with the other two to be um, the new mobility master plan. Okay, well, we'll, we'll wait to hear about that later. Yeah. Thank you. We're excited about that. Thank you. All right, thank you. Okay, thanks Ruth. We're going to go ahead and jump into the development process with the commission here this evening. And again, a lot of this is, uh, uh, you know, most of y'all are, are really familiar with, but we're going to just go ahead and cover that. Uh, zoning review, subdivision review, site development. This is essentially kind of the pattern and the flow fundamentally of development uh, that goes along um, does the zoning allow something or, or do we go through a zoning case followed by platting as part of the subdivision regulations and then ultimately site development work through site plan and building permits which is done administratively. Uh, next slide. So a little bit about the development code really that is that is where we focus most of our time on uh, there are other standalone ordinances and we work uh, closely with uh, engineering as to their design standards, but the, the 
chapters that most closely relate to the planning and zoning case reviews you all see are chapter two, which is the zoning chapter. And that's where we get into the, the main zoning districts and their setbacks, their requirements, uh, and the processes for taking zoning cases forward. And then chapter five, which is the subdivision regulations. Chapter five applies not only to the city, but the ETJ as well, our extraterritorial jurisdiction. So there we can find things such as uh, general land plans, uh, which are the big scale plans before platting occurs. Then the processes for preliminary and final platting, administrative platting, those are plats that are reviewed by staff and then uh, approved by mayor and city manager. And then uh, all the details of the subdivision requirements, minimum lot sizes, the setbacks, uh, references to utilities, infrastructure, and things like ped bike uh, elements as well and thoroughfares. Next slide. So let's take a little deeper dive in ter terms of the zoning review and considerations. So as we mentioned, uh, chapter two is where this information is contained. There are several different types of zoning review. Permanent zoning, and we use that uh, name in terms of areas that were annexed in and they are interim zoned uh, when they're first annexed. For example, interim R1, uh, our interim single family, and then permanently zoned to R1 or R1Z. For example, after Greatwood was brought in, we did we had some zoning cases for the R1Z, the, the patio home style or zero lot line style. So by permanent, we don't mean that it can never be requested for change, but it's, it's to differentiate it from an interim category. The rezonings that are going from one standard zone to another, uh, let's say an applicant has a uh, neighborhood commercial site and they want to have it rezoned to a general uh, type zoning like our B2 zone, uh, it will cover those cases, or what you often see with planned development, PD zoning. And finally, conditional use permits, CUPs for short, uh, where a particular use is examined may be appropriate at, at a site, and if so, are there mitigation measures or conditions? Uh, this evening's uh, case later tonight on uh, uh, cellular tower is an example of that. The commission as a recommending body to council on these types of things, you're not uh, approving or denying, you are essentially providing a recommendation under state law. It says the council must receive a recommendation of the commission. Um, and what we always recommend focusing on is governing documents. What does the comp plan say? Does it have any guidance? Well, there are other codes that come into play, other policies, and then also, of course, compatibility with uh, an existing area and or future uses, and try to take a long-term approach to planning. One of the things that Lisa mentioned early on was uh, this need to look for consistency wherever possible. If we had a similar case, did we, in the past, did, did we look uh, at some of the same things? Or are we trying to apply equally consistently? Next slide. We mentioned a little bit about uh, uh, some of the uh, interim to permanent zone. Here I had the, the Greatwood uh, example from some of the commercial. A number of the commissioners will remember that uh, during the last year, staff focused on some of the interim commercial to permanent uh, uh, commercial tracks. Uh, Silva Track, West Airport, that was interim R1, and the developer asked for R1Z for their permanent zoning. And then obviously some future cases that we anticipate in uh, essentially probably by 2021, the Track 5 area of Telfair, which is on the south side of 59. It's currently interim R1 since annexation years ago and, and the developer has submitted a plan development. So those are examples of city initiated and property owner initiated uh, rezonings and permanent zoning. Next slide. Moving on into plan development, uh, custom zoning district, a PD is a custom zone. Um, it is essentially the city uh, determining where appropriate um, 
the uh, council had some determinations in terms of the Telfair commercial and the Imperial development project. A developer can also request it for a mix of uses or some type of alternative uh, standards. One of the things that uh, needs to be contained in the PD uh, is uh, custom regulations, uses, and a layout plan. And it should be for high quality uh, development projects that um, uh, are essentially codified through that. It's a custom zoning district custom regulations. It can be different than the code, but is not to be used primarily just for getting around code requirements. And in, in your decision making, future land use plan and, and other elements of the code can provide additional guidance and criteria. Next slide. We talked a little bit about uh, the overall PDs, and we've talked about that it's a custom zone. Um, we will provide review and comments prior to the PNC. And again, there are minimum development code requirements such as minimum acreage or certain provisions that need to be present in the PD. Next slide. So there are two, there are two different processes for plan development. Um, one is what we essentially call the first step PDs, which are called general development plans for short. Um, the, the GDP is essentially uh, not going to be able to be used for development to, to get a building permit, but it is, it is the first step to laying out usually larger areas. An example would be the uh, imperial uh, development, the entire imperial development was contained in a GDP. And then the second type final development plans or FDPs, uh, essentially once they're approved, they provide the detailed plan to go ahead and site plan, plat and, and get building permits for an area. Those are more detailed. Um, those are uh, going in more specifically. Examples can be some of the retail type PDs on the north side of 59 within Telfair. Uh, such as the University Commons area, uh, or areas uh, that uh, have been done up in Imperial, such as the Imperial Lofts or the, um, uh, essentially like the Crown Garden single family neighborhood, for example. You must have those final development plans to actually develop the property. And if a developer is ready and has the details, they do not have to go through a general development plan. But uh, the larger the area, the more applicable that process usually is, or if they don't know enough of the details uh, to carry out a file. We'll go ahead and move to the next slide. Conditional use permit, type of zoning process. So when you look at the land use matrix, which is in the development code, uh, we have uses that are allowed by right, and then we have those that are allowed with a C in the matrix. So Essentially what we're saying there is um, it, it uh, is going to be allowed with a conditional use permit. We have uh, a process for CUPs when a commercial development is right on the edge of a residential neighborhood. Uh, we have site by site determination and a conditional use permit. The use may or may not be appropriate depending on the compatibility with an area zoning and, and uh, other uses. And based on the compatibility, um, looking at different types of uses that require a conditional use permit, such as a hotel, private school, uh, churches in the residential zoning districts, for example, and auto related uses might be fuel, uh, might be car wash, might be car sales, uh, for example. Cell towers are another example uh, in our uh, B2 uh, district that require conditional use permit. So the PNZ has the role there of uh, either approving, uh, recommending approval or recommending denial to the council. Um, approval is usually with some specific exhibits, such as a little layout plan, uh, landscaping information, screening, size, uh, those things that uh, bring two things mitigate any impacts and bring assurance essentially uh, that 
uh, what the applicant is proposing um, is contained in the ordinance uh, with that layout plan and then also uh, often building elevations too that show the uh, uh, vertical view. We'll go to the next slide. Mitigation measures are usually appropriate in most CUP cases, but uh, one of the things that we want to make sure and reinforce is just because a site might need a, some mitigation measures, that should not be misconstrued that uh, that use is automatically inappropriate for a site. And I remember being asked a question one time about that years ago that, well, if you have to have uh, several conditions, isn't that mean that it might really not be appropriate at all? And that's simply not, not necessarily the case. What it means is it, it, it should be thought through. Uh, and again, are there measures that, that uh, can help uh, that compatibility? Uh, examples are uh, whether it be screening, additional setbacks. Um, we've had two-story development near uh, residential that had uh, a, a larger setback. We've had some where windows, for example, were uh, uh, essentially shaded or frosted glass. Uh, there's just a, a number of things that may be possible that make something more compatible uh, versus not allowing. There could be a case where something is just absolutely not appropriate uh, due to its particular location. But again, conditions need to be carefully considered. We talked to uh, you again about consistency. We do try to look at similar cases when we have a case. Are there things that we've looked at in the past that are still appropriate? Uh, we want to be uh, treating folks fair on that. We want to also make sure that when we know something about those that we share that with y'all as commissioners. Technical information, in some cases, certain technical information uh, can be appropriate with mitigation uh, examination. This could be uh, some type of noise study if there's a business that, uh, that might have noise concerns or again, some type of view shed uh, or, or a sight line type thing. Again, it depends on what the issue is, but those things can help with decision making. Layout plan, we mentioned that, and uh, like we said, typically includes uh, also some landscape plans and elevations so that uh, we can look closely at uh, uh, the scope and scale of the development. Next slide. We're going to move now into subdivision process. So we essentially switched in the development code to the chapter five section, and the Planning process, as well as the occasional general land plan process, uh, are parts of that uh, that you uh, will periodically deal with. A general land plan, uh, the commission's role is similar to rezoning in that you are making a recommendation to council. Council has the final authority on general land plans, and uh, whereas the plats, uh, preliminary and final plats. Uh, which includes replatting, uh, are the purview of the commission. They don't go to council. Some cities do uh, have them go to their council uh, as a final authority. Uh, Sugarland City Council in the 1990s updated their code to have the commission be the final say. The uh, administrative platting provisions are also contained in there. And then all the design criteria is referenced as well as uh, uh, other uh, information about infrastructure construction plans. Next slide. So that general land plan review, uh, what guides that type of review? And I'm gonna show you some brief examples too here in a minute, but you're looking at things like the comprehensive plan. What does the future land use plan say? What are some planning criteria that the comp plan has? Uh, if it's a large, a uh, fairly large area that's more than just one type of use. You may have residential and commercial. You may show some mixed use areas depending on what is being proposed. Uh, buffering is important to look at. And then if they have parkland, open space, or other public facilities. When you have a development as large as Telfair that had a general land plan or Imperial or Riverstone, which is an ETJ, uh, those had mixes of all of those various things. So you're looking at that, and you're also looking at the major streets, your, your arterial streets, the, the biggest 
uh, movers, essentially, and then collector streets. We're not normally looking at local street frameworks uh, or that type of thing, but we're looking at those overall uses, uh, those thoroughfares, buffering, and other special uh, elements that, that go along with the proposed development. Again, Planning Commission makes a recommendation. Council uh, has the final authority. Next, next slide. So here's just two examples, uh, well known to, to many of you. The uh, Telfair General Land Plan to the left and with uh, 59 uh, cutting across that. Track four is the area on the north side of 59 and track five is what we refer to on the south side. Uh, and those have, there's been quite a bit of development completion as far as track four, and there's still a number of areas to develop in the uh, track five area in the commercial. On the uh, right hand side, um, face of the screen, the uh, Imperial General Land Plan, which contains, again, those land use areas with uh, the uh, development as well as the main framework of streets, the major thoroughfares and the uh, arterial collectors, and then uh, the some various notes, buffering, uh, and information on general acreages. Those uh, are just two examples, but they're two of our bigger ones uh, as far as the city. Next slide. We'll move into uh, plat review uh, as part of the subdivision regulations. Uh, what is used as far as uh, uh, reference gu uh, guides to that, what does staff use, and what do we point out? We point out any previously approved general land plans or plans or plats, especially if a read plat, and some major elements of the comprehensive plan periodically, depending on what, what the uh, references are. Platting is a essentially a ministerial action uh, it's objective. It's not a matter of what we like or don't like. Uh, the uh, zoning should guide the land use. The planning, if it meets the requirements under state law, the Planning and Zoning Commission must approve. Uh, state law mandates specific time frames. And as we talked uh, earlier in the presentation, these got more specific, including more references to criteria in the 2019 legislative session where uh, the state focused reinforced time frames for approval or denial and also reinforced the need for uh, if you're approving with conditions, they must be specified and cited as far as major sections of code and as well as if a plat is denied, it has to have very specific reasons for that. Uh, again, this is uh, where the state has gone further in terms of not wanting uh, any kind of arbitrary uh, disapprovals of plats. Uh, there could be more uh, state law changes over time in the future, but again, what we did, uh, uh, we took forward some amendments to our code that clarified a number of things in platting and also uh, reinforced the mention of the conditions and the siting we also prepared, and, and the last time we took plats forward with y'all, a essentially a, a, a plat guidebook uh, with some essentially some uh, references and checklist type information for the commission to help y'all in your decision making. And we're continuing to uh, update that, including uh, some additional reference information. We will provide that for you each time you have a plat or plats on the agenda so that you have a reference document. It's not designed to replace the code, but it's designed to help everyone stay on track and us meet fully meet the uh, intent of the state law and also uh, make sure that uh, we've grouped some of those typical areas uh, of review. So we'll continue to do that uh, as we go forward with uh, platting. And again, some of that uh, is an effort to respond to some of these various uh, state law changes. Next slide. Talking briefly about preliminary plat uh, review, compliance with subdivision regulations. If it's within the city, it complies with zoning 
And if it's an area where a general land plan has been approved, uh, it needs to be in compliance with the general land plan. When a plat is part of a general land plan area, we're gonna always try to make sure in our report that we mention the compliance with the uh, general land plans. That's part of it because again, the general land plan is part of the subdivision process. Overall street layout, if we've got uh, uh, streets that are being created, lot dimensions, building setbacks, and um, essentially we are not looking at preliminary plats for the decimal point uh, type measurements. We're looking at general measurements. What is the reason for the preliminary plat if you're uh, uh, looking at it from the commission standpoint or from the developer standpoint? It's to essentially get a, an overall uh, layout and lot uh, area uh, authorized so that you then can move on toward final platting with the more detailed construction plans, such as your streets, utilities, all of those detailed engineering work. So it doesn't have to be the detail of the final, but it is essentially to uh, get some decision-making on those layouts and th that uh, information. Next slide. Here is a simple example. This was in the Riverstone neighborhood. Uh, and we can see uh, a single family subdivision had a collector street coming into it. Uh, the overall lots, these are not these are not required to be prepared by a surveyor. Land planners can pre uh, prepare them. Some engineering companies prepare them, but uh, again, they're not required to have all of the detailed information that the final is. Next slide. Final plant review, kind of building on what we were talking about. Here we're going into more detail, the specific dimensions. Uh, that includes the uh, course and bearing, the, the uh, uh, street layout, radii, dimensions. Usually if there's very many dimensions, there's gonna be uh, uh, tables with uh, essentially uh, your curve and line tables. Um, got to be prepared by a registered professional surveyor in Texas. Will contain any new easements uh, proposed uh, or also some separate instrument file numbers in some cases where separate instruments are used. And it'll have those certification blocks and notaries and notes that uh, are required for a final for it to be processed. The infrastructure construction plans, the commission doesn't review those, but at the same time that you turn in your final plat as a developer, the uh, any infrastructure uh, that comes along with that that's required uh, has to be shown on construction plans that are submitted to the staff for review. Uh, those can be turned in ahead of the final, but they can't be turned in later than the final. As we mentioned, must be prepared by a surveyor and then reviewed and approved or denied by the planning commission. Next slide. Here I wanted to show you, uh, this is that same neighborhood. This is the final plat uh, of it. And again, this contained the easements. It has on the left-hand side, there's a whole list of master notes. The right-hand side uh, shows multiple tables, curb and line, bearing distance, uh, all of those. And then there's also recordation information about the neighboring properties and some other separate instruments. This is the second sheet, the first sheet would contain signature blocks and uh, all, all of those uh, things. But again, this pours into the uh, level of detail examples. Next slide. We kind of move out of the, the planning realm and briefly mention uh, your role as the airport zoning commission, which is not something that we normally think about. And that's because we don't typically have cases. But one of the things specified in the development code and also state law is if you have uh, airport zoning in your city, uh, which is airport land use controls, then you have to have an airport zoning commission. So the planning commissioners served with that hat in case we had a case. PNZ has had a few cases over time relating to adding some zoning or eliminating some zoning or changing. Uh, as airport zoning commission. You know, essentially, it's the same body. Uh, you just would serve 
has a different uh, role, a different meeting essentially with those type of topics. Um, if we had a case, uh, we would be planning on doing a separate workshop and some preparation and orientation to kind of go into a deeper look at that. So that's not something we would expect you to go in cold on. Uh, it's not something though that that uh, that uh, we would get into heavy detail this evening on this orientation. But again, it is a role that the commission could be called on to serve. For example, the uh, uh, ZBA, which um, uh, Mr. Brown has served in, uh, ZBA is charged with hearing uh, airport zoning height variances if one was filed. There actually hasn't been one up to this time filed, but again, the ZBA members could be wearing a different hat in that role, just like the planning uh, commission could be wearing the hat of airport commission uh, if called upon. So those are essentially right now uh, as a dual role, uh, should those be needed. Next slide. That is everything I had on the development. Uh, Lauren is gonna take you all through the staff role as far as a uh, number of things that go on uh, behind the scenes and things we work with, unless yep. there's any questions on that information uh, that we just presented. All right, great. I will take us up a notch because I know we've got several slides to go, um, but I'm going to briefly go through um, staff's role kind of behind the scenes and expand on a little bit of that slide that uh, Lisa popped up earlier. So um, planning department is the liaison to the commission. So we will uh, prepare all your case materials um, after we've gone through a, um, a submittal and, and worked with applicants. As part of the case materials, you know, we'll advise the commission uh, on on the case and and um, kind of the details of it, and uh, then you know to prepare you all to to make your recommendation uh, to council or rule on a plat. We also coordinate with other staff, uh, other city staff, uh, such as the engineering department, our um, public works traffic guys on, on some of our uh, more technical reviews, the traffic impact analysis, uh, drainage studies. Um, several other kind of technical reviews that we do. Next slide, please. So our staff work, we plan the city, of course, but we do uh, some other stuff. So uh, as Ruth mentioned, we do facilitate uh, long range planning through through her team and, and through the master plans and, and the uh, future land use, uh, future land use plan. We also work with the uh, public and our decision makers. So um, you all and uh, city council and, and anybody else on any of our uh, boards or boards or commissions and um, encourage and educate them on uh, the case. They may have received a public hearing notice or their neighbor was talking about it and they want to know what's going on. So we take that opportunity to um, kind of educate them as best we can uh, on, on the case and uh, answer any questions they have. Again, provide technical recommendations as, as part of our uh, review um, of, of different cases uh, and then coordinate implementing those plans. You know, you all approved a conditional use permit or, or a PD, you know, we'll implement that and uh, take it through the process of development review. Next slide, please. So behind the scenes, I'll expand a little bit more on, on what Lisa was mentioning. So um, we do uh, work with, again, the, this, our citizens, uh, our development community, a lot of meeting prep um, to ensure that we have uh, everything ready in, in your uh, agenda packet and in the uh, uh, applications before we, we take material forward to y'all. And that, that includes extensive work with applicants, uh, usually several months of uh, making sure, you know, we vetted out everything uh, before we take something before the, before the commission. And then putting together those public hearing notices, that's, that's a lot of the meeting prep too. And then Again, responding uh, to the community uh, when when the notice has gone out or when, when they hear a or when they see a, a public hearing sign out in the community. Next slide, please. Oh. Is there one before? That? No. Okay. No, I think there's one before that. Thank you. So part of our um, review is, is, again, we make the recommendation in our uh, agenda requests and our staff reports to, to the commission. Um, we also try to sum up, you know, background on the, on the site or background on, on the proposal. 
um, going through some mitigation, if it's CUP, as, as Doug was mentioning, you know, a lot of those things that we build into our reports. And then we have the uh, our presentation to you all where we try to outline and, and, and um, kind of highlight some of the key components of the case or, or of the um, maybe the PD district, the overall layout and landscape plan. We try to highlight some of those things for you all during the presentation to, um, to get your feedback on. And then as staff, we we uh, participate in the development review committee where we've reviewed these applications with the other departments and, and gone through some of these technical studies and um, reviewed through the material as, as with internally before uh, putting together material for the commission. Next slide, please. And so mentioning development review committee, that is a staff review committee made up of internal departments. It is co-chaired by, uh, by us in the planning development services department, as well as our colleagues and counterparts in the engineering department. Uh, it's also attended every week by fire, our public works folks, traffic, utilities, right away, um, parks, our, our building plans examiners, and uh, economic development or, or airport as needed, depending on depending on the project. Next slide, please. And then after, after you all have reviewed a, a case, a CUP, a PD, a rezoning, and, and council's taken action, then we move forward in some of those uh, reviews and, and processes that, that Doug was going through. The, the plat, bringing the plat before the commission, um, the applicant then records it, after you all have uh, made a made a recommendation on uh, the approval of a final plat. Then we move into more of the administrative review, the site plan package where um, they'll, they'll, you know, get their um, engineer drawings together and architectural drawings and submit that to staff for staff review. So that's where some additional uh, traffic work can come in. We review detention, uh, you know, our building codes, our fire codes, all of our zoning and development codes, everything comes into play there. And then, uh, we move into building permits and then we construct things that we've all seen. So it's really um, hopefully for you guys. I know it is for us as staff to see something taken through submittal, the very early, you know, um, bones of the process and then getting through it and, and seeing it on the ground um, is how we go through this process. Next slide. And then finally, administrative plats. So this is the other type of plats uh, that the commission does not see. So these are also, also authorized under chapter 212 in our development code and given um, the authority for staff to review them and uh, be approved by and signed by the city manager and the mayor. So there's some caveats to how it can be administrative, uh, less than four or fewer lots, must have access to utilities and, and streets. It's not creating any new streets. Um, so if we have a, a, a vacant commercial property on an existing street and it just hasn't been platted, you know, that can be a, a minor plat. Um, sometimes some of our smaller commercial properties go through minor uh, and amending plats. And amending plats can also just adjust uh, lot lines or if there was a wrong description on a plat or a master note, you know, they can go through an amending plat for, for staff review. So I think that was my last slide. The next slide, I'll send it back to Lisa and Ruth. Thanks, Lauren. Okay, so um, one of the things that we've started doing over the last, I think, few years is kind of giving you a glimpse at some of the other items that are not necessarily development or applicant generated. Um, kind of turn them as, as your work plan. And those consist of your annual kind of recurring items that we already touched on, the master plan annual report, review with CIP, making sure uh, you're completing your uh, required training um, as well as um, things such as master plans. And Ruth is gonna go through a couple of those that are gonna be headed your way um, this next year, as well as some strategic um, and implementation projects um, that staff has been working on. Um, they can also include things such as updates to our development code that may pop up periodically. Um, I know we had a couple over the last uh, few years uh, related to parking garage lighting, addressing state law changes and things like that, but there could be others that we bring forward to you uh, throughout the year as well. And, and then one thing I wanted to mention, I know, again, several of you had the opportunity to participate and I really appreciate um, so many of you jumping in and, and participating in the, the annual conference this year it was a little bit different, obviously. Um, it was a virtual, um, in a virtual setting. However, it was really unique because um, it was uh, a collaboration between 
six states, uh, chapters of the American Planning Association, um, including Texas, Arkansas, I believe Oklahoma, Louisiana, New Mexico, and Kansas, I believe, all came together to put on uh, this virtual, uh, what we call a cross-chapter collaborative conference. And so one of the things that I'm going to be working to put together is some type of a, a workshop where we can each um, kind of share some insights some takeaways that um, that we each might have um, kind of observed um, for many of the sessions that we uh, had a chance to, to view. One of the other things that was really unique, um, because it was a virtual conference, we will have access uh, to all of the um, videos and PowerPoints for all of the sessions. So for you, for members that, that weren't able to participate or that are just coming on to the commission, um, we'll still possibly have an opportunity to kind of um, share that knowledge uh, with you. So more to come on that. Um, we'll be looking for a unique way for us to kind of all kind of um, share our insights on that. But um, they will be posting all of those online, hopefully in the next few weeks, and I'll make sure to send out the link for that as well. So you can refresh, or if you didn't have the opportunity to check out some of the sessions, um, you can go back it and view any of those. Um, next slide. One back, there we go. This will, this will be my last slide, but just to cover some of those annual items. So typically in the springtime, April, May-ish timeframe is when the CIP review is brought forward to you for a review and recommendation. Um, and then typically in the fall, October, November timeframe is when the, the annual conference is held. We complete your orientation typically after the appointment process. And we always bring forward the master plan and the reports uh, to you. So as Ruth mentioned, those will, that will be coming to you shortly. Um, and then one other thing we wanted to touch on, uh, one other hat you get to wear is uh, being a liaison uh, to the city council uh, meeting. So um, throughout the year, you will have, <laughs> I see that, Dan, you're excited. Um, you'll have a month or two where you will be the designated liaison uh, for planning and zoning commission to attend city council meetings. Um, we'll be sending out the schedule for the 2021 calendar year um, to you shortly. So stay tuned um, and uh, really appreciate everybody's time this evening. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Ruth. Okay, next slide, please. So I'm just going to walk you through a handful of projects that will be coming your way. Um, the first one is the wastewater master plan. Um, this update's been going on for, I think, about a year and a half or two years now, and it's addressing the um, policy needs for utilities in the ETJ, as well as explaining, expanding the planning area to the newly annexed Great Wind and New Territory areas, and incorporating the recommendations from the recently adopted Integrated Water Resource Plan. Uh, next slide. So you will be seeing this um, and providing feedback on policy recommendations as well as making a recommendation to City Council on the plan. Um, we anticipate bringing forward first the public hearing and then um, having you make your recommendation either later this year or possibly in early 2021. Next slide. The next one is the water master plan amendment. So this is just for south of the Brazos, whereas the wastewater master plan is an update for the entire city. This is just focusing on the south of the Brazos area and um, establishing a utility plan for that area. Um, it incorporates River Park, Greatwood, and the other rural areas that are in our, in our ETJ south of the Brazos. And it's really going to capitalize on the work that's being done with the wastewater master plan um, that I just mentioned. Next slide. Um, so like with the wastewater master plan, your role will be to provide feedback on policy recommendations in the update and then ultimately make a recommendation to city council on the plan. And we anticipate this one coming forward to you, um, hopefully early to kind of springtime of 2021. Next slide. Now we have the mobility master plan, which is what Dan was um, talking about earlier and I'm really excited about this project. This is something that we've been working on and talking about for several years now and it's um, really underway now. Um, so this is an integration of um, three existing mobility related plans, um, the master thoroughfare plan, the pedestrian and bicycle master plan, and then the comprehensive mobility plan, which I'm, as I mentioned earlier, is not an official master plan, but it, there's a lot of elements to it that really make it similar to the other master plans. And so um, those three master plans will go away and just become the mobility master plan. 
it will become the official master plan for mobility. Um, and so um, we will be looking at the um, comprehensive plan goal of superior mobility and really further defining what that means. Um, really focusing on effort on shifting or shifting our focus from moving um, vehicles to moving people and providing multiple transportation options to residents, visitors, employees, and tourists. Next slide. Um, so the commission's role is going to be provide feedback on policy recommendations and then ultimately make a recommendation to city council on the plan. Um, this plan just planning effort really just got underway earlier this year. And so we're still in the early stages of it. Um, we will be bringing the kind of a, a bigger introduction on the project as well as um, the first deliverable in the, the process, um, which is the state of Sugarland mobility, which kind of outlines the existing conditions of um, the mobility system in Sugarland. So you'll get to see that at your next meeting um, in November. And then um, we will begin uh, along with the mobility task force, which is our citizen task force that Tim Hart is actually a part of. Really excited to have you um, there with us and, and here tonight. Um, and we'll be working on drafting the goals. And so we'll be bringing that to the commission um, sometime in the spring of 2021. So we'll have several master plans coming your way um, kind of in the first part of um, 2021. Next slide. Um, another project that we're working on is the implementation of the land use plan and specifically as it relates to the regional activity centers and neighborhood activity centers that were established in the plan. Um, it was adopted in uh, 2018 and outlines the policy direction and guidance for land use decisions and, and reaching the city's long term vision for land use. Um, there were a number of high priority action items. Um, one of them was to evaluate, evaluate the best way to implement the regional activity centers, neighborhood activity centers, and medium density mixed use, um, because we don't have a standard zoning district for um, mixed use type properties. And so right now, as you, you may know, the only process for um, establishing a mixed use area is through the plan development district. And so we'll be evaluating whether that is the best um, process going forward, whether we want to continue using the PD or if we want to establish a standard zoning district or maybe multiple standard zoning districts, or maybe there's something else that um, that we'll end up doing. So next slide. So we will, um, so the regional neighborhood activity centers are, are envisioned to be mixed use areas that have retail office amenities and things like that. Um, we will be looking to the commission um, for your input on that future zoning approach. We are currently in the process of um, selecting a consultant. And so we hope to have um, one on board in the next hopefully month or so, and then we'll be getting that process started. So um, maybe by late, well, probably early 2021 would be the earliest we'd be in front of you because that does take a little bit of time, but um, you know, we'll be excited to, to visit with y'all about your experiences with the PD process and um, talk about the future of, of mixed use in the city. Next. And so I think the last um, project I have to share with you that we will be bringing forward is the Hill Community Engagement Project. Um, for those of you who are not new to the commission, you may remember that we um, brought forward some updates to this zoning district earlier this year. Um, so the land use plan identified this area as a company town neighborhood. Um, this is, if you're not familiar with it, just north of 90A up close to the Imperial Sugar Mill. Um, this project was initiated in the fall of 2018 due to um, the concern that city council and staff were hearing from residents about the redevelopment that was happening in the area. Um, and there was a land use plan recommendation to evaluate whether there should be additional standards put in place to maintain the character of the neighborhood. And so um, we split the project into two phases. Phase one was um, really just engaging the public and finding out, um, did they want to have additional standards to protect the neighborhood? And um, so we did get community direction that they did want us to move forward with, with drafting some additional standards. And so in phase two, which is underway right now, um, we are implementing the recommendations that came out of phase one. Um, and so, as I mentioned earlier this year, we did uh, make some modifications to garage setbacks, porch setbacks, as well as modify the um, district boundary for the Hill area zoning district to expand it a little bit um, for the area north of Lakeview. Next slide. Oops. 
Okay, there it is. <laughs> um, and so we will complete phase two um, over the next few months. And um, we are currently working to draft the design and character regulations um, so that new um, development will be in character with the neighborhood. And so we will continue working with the steering committee. We have a mem five member um, owner um, resident steering committee that we've been working with the staff and also engaging the Hill residents and property owners on um, that project. And so we will be looking to you to really help us um, with administration of the regulations, looking at the way that they're written and, and do they make sense from an administration standpoint, um, since we're doing a, a lot of public engagement um, with the community. Um, and so we anticipate bringing forward um, the design character regulations, um, again, in the spring of 2021. So you may be seeing a lot of me and my staff <laughs> early next year. Um, next slide, I think that may be it for me. Okay, very good. With that, um, I'm happy to answer any questions, and if not, then we can hand it off to Shay. All right, thank you. Good evening, commissioners. Let's see, it's on. Okay, uh, so I am just going to go over a few legal issues with you tonight, um, specifically focusing on the Open Meetings Act and some various things related to it, um, conflicts of interest, and then I'm going to end with just some important points for consideration. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so we'll start by talking about the Texas Open Meetings Act, um, which is a series of statutes basically designed to ensure uh, transparency. Um, they're designed to make sure that conversations about commission business take place in the open before the public. Um, and also they make sure that it's about things that have actually been posted um, so that the public is informed about what the commission is discussing. Um, so basically the general rule is that your meetings have to be open to the public unless the statute expressly permits an executive session. Uh, the board is subject to or sorry, the commission is subject to the act. Um, it applies to the city council, boards or committees um, that have final decision-making authority. And you do have some final decision-making authority over plats, so it does apply. As far as when it applies, it is when there is a quorum of the commission's members, if public business is deliberated or discussed, there are nine of you, so a quorum would be five. Um, and it might apply even if a quorum is not present in what's called a walking quorum, which I'm going to discuss a little bit further in a minute. Uh, that said, it doesn't apply just because you all happen to be at the same place at the same time. Um, if you were all at a social function or a workshop, it only applies if you're talking about public business. Next slide, please. So what is a quorum? Uh, it's a majority of a governmental body, which in your case would be five commissioners. Um, and this particular point next is kind of important in current times. Uh, so a member who participates in a meeting by video conference call, um, like we're doing right now, is considered absent from any portion of the meeting uh, where audio or video communication is lost. That said, if that was to happen, if we were to lose one of you during a meeting like this, uh, the meeting can still continue so long as there is still a quorum present or participating. Uh, which is very good to know. As far as what constitutes a meeting, it's going to be again a quorum of you gathering where public business is discussed and either you participate in the discussion or you call the meeting or conduct or responsible for the meeting. Pretty much the Open Meetings Act is going to apply to all of the, the meetings that, that you have. Um, I said again, it doesn't apply just because you all happen to be in the same place at the same time. Uh, it doesn't, like for example, it doesn't include attendance by a quorum at a candidate forum, a parents or a debate if formal action is not taken and, you know, any discussion of public business is just incidental. Next slide, please. Uh, so uh, one of the requirements of the Open Meetings Act is that the public has to be put on notice as to what the commission is going to be taking up at a meeting. Uh, as far as the notices go, the city secretary's office does handle that. And there are very specific things that are required to be put into the notices, uh, specifically written notice of the date, hour, place, and subject. Um, even if there's going to be an executive session that's anticipated, it does have to be posted. And it has to be fairly specific as to what the subject matter is going to be. Um, you know, if it's going to be with regards to an amending plat 
the Nova will say it's in a mini pot and we'll say what subdivision it's for. Um, we do try to make it as specific as possible so that the public is fully informed um, and also to comply with the act. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, there are records that are required to be kept at the meetings. And this is again, something that the city secretary's office um, takes care of. Um, basically minutes have to be kept for each meeting. Uh, the minutes have to state the subject of each deliberation, indicate the votes, um, and also provide a brief summary of what was discussed. Um, and then at the next meeting uh, after, you know, the minutes are kept, you guys usually you vote on the minutes. Um, next slide, please. Okay, some procedures and requirements with regards to open meetings. Uh, the meeting cannot be convened unless a quorum is present. Um, the act doesn't entitle members of the public to speak at open meetings, um, but it, policy and procedure for the city is we usually do have a public comment session at the beginning of your meetings. Uh, this next part is really important. Um, if someone was to speak at the, the public comment portion of a, of a meeting, um, and they ask something about an item that's not on the agenda, you can't really discuss the item. All that you can do is make a statement of fact regarding the issue, a statement of policy regarding the issue, or propose to place the item on a future agenda for deliberation. But that is it. You can't actually go into discussing anything that is not posted. Uh, next slide, please. So, you can actually go into executive sessions uh, if, the, if there's a statutory reason to do so. Usually that's going to be for something related to economic development or consultation with an attorney. It is rare that the commission would actually go into executive session for something. Usually that's more so for city council meetings. Uh, that said, it is something that could happen. Uh, there is a procedure that has to be followed if you are going to go into an executive session. Um, you have to have a quorum. First, you would have an open meeting uh, or you'd convene the meeting. Uh, then you have to announce to the public that you are going to be going into a closed meeting. Uh, you have to identify the section of law that allows the closed meeting, which would be part of the posted notice. Uh, and then the city secretary's office would keep a certified agenda or a tape recording of the meeting. Next slide, please. So, it is very important to comply with the Open Meetings Act because there are both civil and criminal things that can happen. Um, if a member of the public thinks that, you know, an, there's an item that's been discussed improperly outside of an open meeting, they could actually bring a civil lawsuit to force compliance with the act. Um, and it could potentially affect acts that are taken. There are also criminal penalties that are enforced by the DA, county attorneys, and criminal district attorneys. Next slide, please. So I'm just gonna go over some of the violations um, that we have to be careful to look out for. Uh, the first one is participating in a closed meeting, knowing that a certified agenda or tape recording is not being made, knowingly disclosing a certified agenda or tape recording of a closed meeting to a member of the public, or, and this is the one that's really gonna be um, I guess more of an issue because the first two, the city secretary's office and staff are going to make sure that that's being done. Um, but the big violation to watch for is knowingly calling, aiding and calling or organizing or participating in an unlawful closed meeting. Next slide, please. All right. This next violation is based on a prohibited series of communications, and this is going to be your walking quorum. Um, so I am going to read the language of the statute and then I'll kind of go into it a, in a little bit more casual language. Um, so basically you, it is a violation of law to knowingly engage in at least one communication among the series of communications that each occur outside of a meeting subject to the act and that concern an issue within the jurisdiction of the commission in which the members engaging in the individual communications constitute fewer than a quorum of members, but the members engaging in the series of communications constitute a quorum of members. And the member knew at the time that the member engaged in the communication that the series of communications involved or would involve a quorum or would constitute a deliberation once a quorum of members engaged in the series of communications. And that violation is a class B misdemeanor. Basically, this would arise if there was some sort of situation 
where commissioners were discussing business and enough commissioners were discussing something potentially before the commission that it would constitute a forum. And let's say, you know, you're at a meeting um, and one of you steps outside and then another one of you steps outside and you discuss business. And then the second person or the second commissioner goes back into the other room and another commissioner comes out and starts talking about something and so on and so on until you had five commissioners who had talked about business, not necessarily together, but still at the same time had all discussed it. Um, and it used to just like talk about where maybe, you know, different people would be talking in different rooms, but enough of you would be having a conversation about the item that really it violates the spirit of the act. Now it actually extends to a series of communications, which means emails, things in writing. Um, so pretty much the best way to avoid a walking forum is don't discuss commission business outside of a meeting that's been properly called. Um, don't send emails to each other about things that are going to be before the board. And if you were to get an email from someone about something, do not hit reply all because that is going to be the easiest way to potentially violate uh, this particular statute. Uh, next slide, please. All right, uh, this next slide is going to primarily apply right now to our two new commissioners. Um, Open Meetings Act training is required. Um, pretty much a, anyone subject to the act is required to participate in an education training session, and it has to be done within 90 days of taking the oath of office. Uh, it can be done online through the Attorney General's website, um, and if you need to, we can provide this information to you after the, the meeting if you don't want to worry about writing it down right now. Um, and then there's a certificate that has to be printed and provided to the city secretary's office. Next slide, please. All right, so that pretty much covers the Open Meetings Act. The next thing that we're going to talk about are conflicts of interest, um, which the basic gist is you have to abstain from participation in, discussion of, and vote on a matter before the commission if you have some kind of personal interest um, in it. And it's not just if you have some sort of personal interest in it. If you have a family member that would somehow benefit from the action, um, either personally or financially, if you're involved in a company that would somehow benefit from the action, then you potentially have a, a conflict of interest. Um, and you also have a substantial interest if you do business um, with a company um, that's then doing business or bringing something before the, the commission for consideration. Next slide, please. So if you think that you have a conflict of interest, you are required to file an affidavit with the city secretary's office um, stating what the nature and the extent of the, the interest is. Um, the city secretary's office does have that form. It does have to be filed before the meeting where the item that has the conflict is going to be brought up. Um, and then once the item is, is brought up at a meeting, um, you have to abstain from further participation. Usually we'll just ask you to step out of the, the room while uh, the specific item is being discussed. Next slide, please. So if you were to vote on something where you did have a conflict of interest, say just unknowingly, you don't realize there's a lot of new facts, sometimes accidents happen, um, the action itself wouldn't be voidable unless the person with the conflict would have been a deciding vote um, or it would have impacted the outcome of the action. And if you do knowingly violate the conflict of interest uh, statutes, it is a class A misdemeanor. Next slide, please. Um, it also applies if you have an interest in a subdivided tract. Same thing, you just have to file the affidavit with the city secretary's office before the action is taken. Um, and then you would just abstain and not be involved with the discussion before the commission. Next slide, please. Uh, this is just kind of a flow chart that goes over, you know, do you have a conflict of interest? You know, are you a member of the commission? Yes. Um, do you receive some income from someone that's about to do business with the commission? Yes. You have a conflict of interest. Um, does your relative have something to do or is in some way involved with the company or the issue that's before the commission? It's probably a conflict of interest. Um, next slide, please. And this is just another flowchart. Um, if you have an interest in real property before the commission, 
um, then it's the same thing. You know, you likely have a conflict of interest and you're probably going to need to file an affidavit. I will say, if you ever are in doubt or you have any questions about whether you have a conflict or not, please do not hesitate to let staff know. We will look into it and we will do our best to answer the question for you before the meeting ever happens. Next slide, please. So then I'm just gonna finish up with a few points. Um, first thing, you have to have a quorum to take a meeting or take action. If it's not on the agenda, don't discuss it. Um, this wasn't mentioned previously, but if an applicant um, actually contacts you directly, don't respond, direct them to city staff. And then this isn't on there, but it should be on there. And it's just don't discuss commission business outside of meetings if at all possible. Do not send emails about commission business because then you might run into a walking forum issue. And that is it for me, unless you have any questions. Okay, hey, that's the orientation. So we'll take <laughs> any questions or happy to move on. Does anyone have any questions regarding orientation? Just appreciation. Thanks for all your help. All the information. Yeah, I just want to know when the quiz is. Is that coming up <laughs> next? Yeah, that'll be next time. <laughs> all right. Here, I had a question. At this point, do we get to deny or vote on this? Not accept it. Authority. <laughs> <laughs> we vote now, or do we? Uh, how do we proceed? Yeah. That's a joke. All right. Well, if there are no other questions, thanks very much, Lisa, Doug, Ruth, Lauren, and Shay, for those helpful presentations. It would be uh, for. I'd love to get a copy of the slide deck if that's something that could be distributed. Uh, um, it may be helpful to the members, particularly some of the new members as well. Sure, absolutely. Uh, right. Okay, well, let's move on to the next item. The next item, item six, public hearing. Receive and hear all persons interested in the proposed conditional use permit for a new 130 foot tall T Mobile monopole communications tower on approximately 2,500 square feet located on the rear of the property at 12935 Derry Ashford Road and further identified as lot five, block one, LH Dryer subdivision, volume 194, page 264 in the William Stafford one and a half league, Fort Bend County, Texas. Laura Waller, I believe this is yours, Laura. Yes, yes it is. Good evening. It's been a long haul so far, so I'm not going to rush through this because it's been a while, but um, I will do my best to, to keep it brief. So the tower proposal, um, those do require a CUP for our um, Sugarland Development Code. Um, that just allows a commission and the council in order to have um, a certainty about where this is going, what kind of mitigation factors might be screening, that type of thing, um, and also just be assured of where exactly it's going to make sure it's not going to impact too many residences around. Uh, that being said, here are a couple maps of the location. So mm -hmm. on the you can see the black bar is the entire parcel property there. Um, you might be familiar with the area. It's where the Live Oak Grill is. So in the back of that property, it's a long skinny rectangle. At the rear of the property, they are proposing to lease out a 50 by 50 foot area for this uh, monopole to go up. So that's circled in red in the aerial image on the right. Uh, there's currently a grassy field with some vegetation. They're going to clean out some of that vegetation and put up the pole, as well as uh, some fencing and other uh, more formal landscape around it. Next slide. So an overview of the tower itself. As I mentioned, this is a 50 by 50, uh, so that totals out to 2,500 square foot area at the rear of the Live Oak Grill, which is the address that you see. Uh, the pole is proposed to be 130 feet tall uh, with one antenna currently mounted for uh, T-Mobile. However, there would be room for uh, three more additional antennas for co-location. This, uh, this uh, 50 foot property is uh, 50 feet from both side and rear property lines, so it does meet all setbacks. And there is uh, proposing a, an eight foot wood fence for screening as well as um, hedges and two oak trees provided around the front and sides of the lease space for further buffering uh, where anyone in the Live Oak Grill parking lots would be able to see it. 
There is no residential property nearby. That tends to be one of the biggest priorities of the commission and council, and uh, there is not any nearby residential property. Uh, this CUP is aligned with the comprehensive and future land use plans that you were introduced to earlier tonight. Um, the comprehensive plan and future land use plan do um, mention increasing and having a high tech uh, city as one of the future goals. So this would provide a uh, better service uh, to the area in this in this um, location. And um, additionally, it is far away from any nearby residential. All the surrounding areas are proposed to be future light industrial. So it's a very uh, compatible use for the area. Next slide. So this is the overall site plan. On the left, you can see Dairy Ashford and then the existing building, which is the Live Oak Grill. And then on the far right, you can see the little square and that's going to be where the uh, tower is going up. So again, I mentioned um, 50 by 50 foot lease area. There will be a new a 12 foot wide asphalt driveway just for access to that area, as well as um, gates and two oak trees there in front you can see, and then hedges around uh, three of the sides. They are proposing to use um, the existing shrubbery that's along their rear property line for their uh, screening along the rear. Uh, excuse me, I misspoke earlier. This is not 50 feet from the um, property lines. It is 25 feet from the property lines, excuse me. Um, so, but that does meet uh, the standard setbacks for this area. Next slide. This is an enlarged site plan to show you exactly what the inside is going to look like. So you can see the triangle in the middle is the large pole itself. And then there is some ground mounted equipment. Um, that ground mounted equipment is proposed to be a maximum of eight feet tall. So the eight foot fence would screen all ground mounted equipment. Uh, there is a row of hedges, or as you can see on three sides and two large oak trees there in the front. Um, those hedges are um, currently um, placed at 48 inches separation from center. Uh, typically we do see 36 inches. So that is something that staff wanted to point out. Uh, the same thing with the trees. They are currently marked at three inch caliper. Typically we see four. However, these do meet the standard requirements of the Sugarland Development Code. Therefore, we're bringing it forward to you. Next slide. So this again, um, just shows the landscape plan from an overall view. Uh, you can also see that some of the irrigation notes and the breed of uh, bushes and trees that are being uh, proposed. So as I mentioned, the hedges, uh, the there is going to be uh, 36 and uh, four feet from the center, so 48 inches. Live oaks are proposed to be three and a half inch, uh, three inch caliper rather than um, four. Uh, but however, um, the code only requires two and a half. Although, although we do typically see four inch for uh, conditional use plans. Next slide. So these are the uh, an elevation of the pole itself. Uh, you can see at the top, the very top elevation is 130 feet. The antenna would be mounted at 125 feet. And then those three gray boxes are space for future carriers for co-location in the future. Uh, at the bottom, you can see at the corners, there's where the eight foot fence and all the ground mounted equipment, you can see kind of through that. The top of all of the ground mounted equipment would be eight feet tall. And uh, the only thing above that would be the um, the wires and lines connecting the, the uh, equipment. Next slide. So the uh, applicant did provide us with some computer generated images. This shows uh, what the pole would uh, potentially look like. This would, um, this is view one. So this is uh, from Derry Ashford, uh, 850 feet Northwest of the site. So in the top right corner, you can see the existing view. And then uh, the large picture is, um, has the little tower there right in the center of the image. Next slide. So again, this is the computer generated image. Top right is the current view. And this has the pole added there as well. Next slide. This one is taken from Highway 90, which is uh, quite a bit away from the pole. Uh, you can see in the top right corner, there's um, no pole in the middle between two of the utility poles. And then in the computer generated image, you can see um, a little bit of that pole there right in the very middle. Next slide. And this is the last image um, from further up uh, Route 98. Uh, you can see the pole um, kind of more from the rear looking forward towards uh, Derry Ashford. Next slide. These are the existing site photographs. Um, I did do a quick trip out there and take some of these images. 
So uh, the image at the bottom in the middle, if you can see the two small white stakes, those are showing the, um, the front two corners of the lease space. So that'll, that is uh, approximately where the line would be for the lease space. Um, right in the middle of them and just a few feet back underneath that tree is where the pole is proposed to be located. So um, these other two images are um, on the top left is taken from approximately where the gate would be. Uh, I did not crawl underneath the trees into the brush, but I did uh, stand right at the edge of them approximately where the entrance would be. And I took a picture facing forward. So this is the existing gravel lot and then the live oak grill uh, there towards the front. And then on the right, that is taken from the, um, you can see the parking and the, where the cars are. This is taken from that parking lot. So this shows the view from where the typical uh, patrons of the restaurant would be parking. And you can see um, towards the lease space, you can faintly, faintly see the little white specks where the stakes are. Um, so it is uh, a decent amount of distance from the existing concrete parking lot. Next slide. This is the future land use plan map that um, were, was discussed a little bit earlier by Ruth. So this area is all proposed as light industrial. Uh, currently there is some B2 and some business office. However, uh, light industrial is what it is proposed to uh, develop into over the next few years. So um, a monopole in this area would not be uh, disruptive to these businesses operating. Uh, and it would also support the regional activity center and regional commercial services that are nearby. And you can see the closest residential area is that yellow in the uh, extreme bottom right corner. That is the closest residential to this area. Next slide. Public hearing requirements were all met. Uh, that included sending out mailers to property owners within 200 feet, uh, postings on the newspaper and the website, uh, we have not received any inquiries about this site. And um, as we mentioned, there are no single family neighborhoods within the vicinity because this is um, a B2 area and uh, nearby uh, properties are zoned M1, which is the uh, industrial district. Um, and staff will be happy to answer any questions after the public hearing. Next slide. So your considerations uh, before you uh, host your public hearing, um, we, ask the commission to determine these proposed exhibits. Um, is this appropriate? So there's no nearby residential. It's a primarily industrial uses that surround this area. This uh, tower is supported by the future land use plan and comprehensive plan. Uh, the CUP does include landscaping that meets code. However, as I mentioned previously, this uh, the sizes are not quite up to uh, what we typically see in a CUP with three inch versus four and a 48 inch spacing versus 36. Um, however, due to FCC laws, commission and council um, does have to provide code based conditions if any recommendation for denial is given. Um, there is a time limit on processing these uh, cases because of the FCC regulations. Um, next slide. So, um, so therefore, staff does recommend uh, hosting the public hearing to be followed by the consideration mm -hmm. this evening. If there are revisions needed uh, per the council, that can be part of the motion included as conditions. Um, so staff does recommend hosting the public hearing and then recommending approval with the exhibits as proposed or potentially with any conditions to the mayor and city council. The applicant uh, does have a representative available um, to who will be providing a, a short presentation uh, right now. Next slide. Good evening, Chair. Uh, my name is William Francis. I'm representing SCI Towers. May I begin our uh, presentation? Mr. Francis, if you hold for a minute, let me ask legal do i not need to open the public hearing first uh, this is a continuation of the presentation so you would open after this all right thank you i apologize mr francis please continue not at all thank you chair good evening my name is beth francis and the address is 112 east pecan in san antonio i'm the attorney for sci towers which is a national developer of telecommunication facilities. With me this evening and presenting also by uh, audio 
is Dennis Culligan. Dennis has worked on this project for over a year and has worked closely with Ms. Weller to uh, make sure that we have absolutely the best application that complies with your code to request this conditional use permit. The purpose is to uh, present to you an application and request your uh, recommendation to city council for approval of the tower so that T-Mobile can collate its antennas on the tower so that it can address and resolve a significant gap in its service. The reason the gap is occurring, as the slide indicates, your city is growing. You certainly know this as members of the community, members of the business community, members of this commission. Next slide, please. You're, rec you're being recognized on a national level as one of the fastest growing cities in America. Next slide, please. But with this success and growth that you're experiencing creates a critical demand for wireless service. For example, for the first time ever, there are more wireless devices than there are men, women, and children in the United States. There's 1.2 wireless devices for every man, woman, and child. This creates a significant demand on systems that were designed primarily for different times and different demands. Next slide, please. But critically for you, your businesses, and your residents is the unique ability and need to be, have access wirelessly to E911 emergency call services. Well over 85% now of E911 calls are placed by wireless devices. And they're in the process of now elevating that where very shortly we'll be able to, when necessary, be able to actually text E911 calls. But critical to all of us, particularly the, where Sugar, Ma Sugar Land is located, the portion of the state you're, you're in, emergency service and reverse E911 alerts are so critical to all of us so that you're immediately not have access to information about either natural disasters, floods, hurricanes, et cetera, or man-made disasters. But without this connectivity, your residents and your businesses will not have access to that required public safety feature. Next slide, please. Your city has taken a forefront. You've created a vibrant emergency notification system you're asking your residents and businesses to sign up. The notifications are delivered by email, text, and or phone, so you can understand why wireless uh, companies such as T-Mobile are so interested in, about the need, the public safety need to resolve these gaps in service. Next slide, please. As a result of Hurricane Harvey, your community along with the communities along the Gulf Coast really set a new bar for communities throughout the United States because of the congestion on the E911 systems which many of you I'm sure were familiar with and had to deal with communities such as yours and the surrounding communities look to their social media pages for the first time and use those pages to connect with your residents for emergency services where you located residents would contact cities. So as a result of the initiative of, of cities such as yours, social media pages for cities are no longer just a social need to talk about elections, to talk about schedule and so forth. They've now become a critical public safety feature. And as I can show you on the next slide, your Facebook page from October 7th, is right on point. This was talking about, and many of you obviously viewed it because amazingly, this uh, Facebook page was viewed by 22,900 people. That's about a quarter of your population who look to your Facebook page for information regarding direction, information regarding Hurricane Delta. Next slide, please. Site plan, uh, next slide, please. Ms. Waller did an excellent job walking through the site plan with you. It's been a long evening for you. Um, we'll be available to answer any questions, but again, uh, if we can go to the next slide, a little bit better detail on the actual compound. If we go to the next slide, please. 
as Ms. Waller indicated, the size of the compound really is designed to facilitate not only the placement of the tower, which is the triangular feature in the center, also the placement of the T-Mobile as the first co-locating wireless company's equipment in the lower right, but adequate space to provide for up to three additional carriers, thereby eliminating the need for future proliferation of towers. Just to point out the close work that Dennis and Ms. Waller worked together on the landscaping plan, very comprehensive landscaping plan. We're pleased to work with her on that, and it was just an excellent working relationship. Next slide, please. I just want to give you a profile. It's a board-on-board fence at eight foot high, as Ms. Waller indicated. The height, as she indicated, will obscure the view of the ground equipment. Next slide, please. She did an excellent job identifying the elevation of the tower for you. Again, what we call the top of steel will be 135 feet, facilitating what we call a 125-foot rad center, and that is the center placement of the proposed T-Mobile co-located antennas. That rad center is important, as we'll talk about momentarily, the RF propagation maps to provide sufficient height in order to resolve the gap in service. Additionally, as pointed out, the tower has been designed by SCI to add additional three wireless carriers. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. As part of the application process, T-Mobile submitted to you their letter of intent that if we are able to receive your recommendation and then City Council's approval of this request for the conditional use permit, T-Mobile will co-locate its antennas, as I just expressed, on the tower. They also point out in the letter that all existing towers in the proposed area of coverage resolve the gap are either already occupied by T-Mobile or are insufficient to address the needs. Now, next slide, please. I want to walk through with you very quickly what the radio frequency propagation maps are and to emphasize for you the excitement and the benefit this tower will bring. What you're looking at now is the radio frequency propagation maps prepared by the T-Mobile radio frequency team. To give you some of the identifying marks, you'll see the black box that has the identifying numbers of the tower location by T-Mobile, but you see the arrow right above the black box. That's the side of the proposed tower. Around the perimeter, you see a series of triangles. Those are the location of T-Mobile's existing antennas, whether they're on existing towers or on rooftops. Up in the upper right-hand corner, you see a legend. And what that is, is a legend showing what are called the DBMs, decibel per milliwatt. And what's counterintuitive about this is you would think that the better coverage would be the higher decibel per milliwatt, but it's exactly the opposite. The lower the number, the better the coverage. So in this situation, the ideal goal that T-Mobile is looking for to accomplish with your recommendation is to reach that green, what we call in-building commercial coverage. Right now, you see the area is surrounded by the red, which is very insufficient coverage. In fact, it's only probably going to be coverage and service needs, what we call in-vehicle, traveling cars. The result is that because of the commercial area, because of the intense development of commercial properties, there is a lack of commercial in-building coverage resulting in either drop calls, buffered data uploads, buffered data downloads, critical to businesses, and particularly in this area. So if you'll look where the black box is, and if we'll go to the next slide, we'll just show you why both SEI is excited about this opportunity to bring T-Mobile in to resolve this gap. 
what you're seeing now is the result of the additional and the the addressing that red gap in service that was so predominant. If we can go back to the previous slide, we can refresh ourselves. Now you can see and start appreciating why this is such an urgent situation. The scope and size of the gap in service in red being addressed by the next slide, please. This opportunity. The next slide, please. This is a map enhanced with existing coverage with what are a listing of the call volumes handled by T-Mobile's existing antennas. We wanted to show you just the sheer volume of 911 call volume that was handled just during a 30-day period. And we wanted, T-Mobile wanted to present to you that this tower will also be able to serve to offload additional demand for E911 if and when it's necessary and calls are placed. Next slide, please. This is just a conclusion sheet prepared by T-Mobile. Again, emphasizing that to reach their goals of the in-building commercial coverage, particularly by this area, as Ms. Waller indicated, industrial commercial need for in-building service. It will provide the data speeds of two megabits per second and 16 kilobits per second upload and download that are critical for commercial in-building service. Next slide, please. Very quickly, I just would like to walk through with you the process, how we got to where we are today, and the steps that are taken both by T-Mobile and SCI. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Just again, a refresher on the zoning map that was presented to you. The site is in a B1 zoning, B2, excuse me, zoning district, which is permits telecommunication towers. Directly across from Derry Ashford is BO, business office, which zone does not permit telecommunication towers. Next slide, please. Now, once T-Mobile identified this gap in service, they create what they call a search ring. And in this situation, it's a quarter mile search ring. What this means is the radio frequency team analyzed the gap and concluded that in order to resolve the gap and achieve the benefits that I explained and displayed for you in the RF maps, a SCI must construct a tower located within that quarter mile search ring depicted by the yellow circle. This then is handed off to Dennis and the SCI team. And Dennis and the SCI team then goes through the analyzing process of a zoning, eliminating sites that are not zonable, such as the property directly west of Derry Ashford that is in the business office, sites that are not available, obviously, by existing buildings, highways. And then Dennis starts contacting landlords going on site to determine are there available sites that meet what the federal courts call and we label as the ABLES. Is it zonable? Is it developable? Is it leasable? And are utilities and access available? After going through that process and contacting up to 24 sites, this site is the only available site that meets the criteria leasable. We do have a lease. Zonable, it's within the proper zoning district. As pointed out by Ms. Waller, there's access is available and will be available to the access roadway and also utilities are available. So it is the only available site to fulfill the needs to resolve this gap. Next slide, please. In conclusion, I just would like to touch with you very quickly the impact of the Federal Telecommunications Act and the recent FCC 2018 order. Next slide, please. Federal law preempts decisions that effectively prohibit service. 
This is from the, not only the Telecommunications Act, but also the recent FCC 2018 order. What this means is we believe that we have provided to you through submittals and working so closely with your team to provide documentation, in particular, the radio frequency maps that were presented, the testimony this evening, that a denial of this request will, according to the FCC 2018 order, materially inhibit T-Mobile's ability to resolve its service needs or improve its service capabilities. Also, Commission, we believe that we have shown to you there is a significant gap in uh, T-Mobile's uh, wireless service that needs to be resolved and through the process that we have gone through to identify this site and the testimony that we're presenting you tonight and the submittals, there is no available alternative site that would remedy the gap. Next slide, please. Therefore, Chair, members of the Commission, we respectfully request your recommendation to the Council for, excuse me, for approval of a conditional use permit for this tower. On a personal note, again, we deeply appreciate the relationship that we've developed with staff and uh, the, the detail that staff went through is reflected by the procedures you saw earlier, very comprehensive and work closely with Dennis and the team. And Dennis and I look forward to answering any questions that you may have and respectfully request your recommendation for approval. Thank you. You're muted, Matt. You're muted. Thank you very much. Uh, I was just saying uh, th thank you very much, Mr. Francis, for your presentation and for your patience as we consider the other items uh, and recognitions on the agenda. Laura, does that conclude the staff presentation? All right, very well. I will then open the public hearing at this time. Citizens who desire to address the commission with regard to matters pertaining to the public hearing will be received at this time. Uh, City Secretary, has anyone submitted comments or registered to speak on this matter? No, sir. All right, therefore, I will, unless anyone else is here to speak, I will close the public hearing at this time. We'll move on to the next agenda item, which is consideration and action on a recommendation of the proposed conditional use permit for a new 130-foot-tall T-Mobile monopole communications tower on approximately 2,500 square feet located on the rear of the property at 19, excuse me, 12935 Derry Ashford Road, further identified as lot five, block one, LH Dryer subdivision, volume 194, page 264A in the William Stafford one and a half league, Fort Bend County, Texas, to the mayor and members of city council. At this time, I will do my best to go through the line and see if any of our commissioners have any comments. Uh, Commissioner Hart, we'll start with you. Any comments? I just have a, a question uh, about the uh, access easement through the parking lot. Did, did that have any effects to the required parking capacity for the um, business? No. no. Okay. Um, the, the live oak grill does still meet all of their requirements. Okay. Thank you. That was the only comment question I had. Thank you, Chairman. All right. Thank you, sir. Uh, Commissioner Brown. My, my question, thank, thank you. Uh, my question was on the on the landscaping. It seems that there's at least some requirements and some historical landscaping that's been done, and this falls a little bit short of that. Is there a reason that we're not installing landscaping that's that would be traditional and normal in circumstances like this? Um, that was uh, what the plans were put forward as. Um, we did mention um, that the minimum requirements are uh, 2.5 and uh, 48 inches. And so that's what they provided. Uh, although I did uh, in my comments say that CUPs and PDs typically see four inch and 36 inches. Um, however, this is the direction that they decided to go. And then along those same lines, it looks like the, the back of the site, which would be the easterly part of this area has got no landscaping on it at all. Is there a reason? Is that is that not required or is it just something they've chosen not to present? So for that, staff um, has let them um, 
count the existing landscaping that's along that rear property line as part of their landscaping. Okay. That is why they have not added any extra hedges there uh, because there is quite a bit of uh, existing landscaping already in that area. Gotcha. Um, you've answered my questions. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. AP, any questions or comments? Um, no, no real questions. I just um, appreciate the thoroughness of the presentation. I, I guess the only sort of question or comment that I had was, it, it sounds like there's no uh, impact to any residential areas, but will there be any other impacts in terms of road closures or anything like that during the installation period for the tower and, and the, the surrounding areas? Um, I believe that maybe Mr. Culligan can answer that. Um, as they're bringing in the pole itself, uh, there might be some traffic issues. Um, Mr. Culligan, can you answer that? Certainly. Um, anticipating it as, uh, like you said, with the tower coming in, there may be a minor delay. If we need to uh, put together a um, temporary traffic plan for that, we'd be willing to do that as well. But that would all be handled um, internally with our Public Works Traffic Division. Correct. Gotcha. Okay, no, that was the only other thing that I had. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Commissioner Watley? Uh, yes, I do have a couple questions. Um, um, Mr. Francis, thank you for being here. I agree we have a, a great need to expand capacity for widening. So you made your point there very clearly. I'm with Commissioner Brown. I think the landscaping fell short. I mean, uh, for what you're spending on a tower, on the tower, my concern was the landscaping. And you mentioned quite a few times, Laura, in the uh, in the proposal, we'll have landscaping attended to and maintained for a year. I'm concerned what happens after the year. And the second question I had, um, looking at the lease on this, I don't know what your lease term is. What happens if the lease is nullified or void? Who maintains the structure? What happens to the structure and landscaping if the lease falls through? Or what, what happens to all this if it just if it is if it goes away? Commissioner, uh, on the first question on landscaping, uh, Dennis, would you like to address that question on the um, difference in what is proposed versus what Ms. Waller uh, suggested? Yes, sir. Um, the landscaping proposed, it met the requirements of the code. And so that was what the engineer had um, designed for us on that. Uh, was with regards to the maintenance of that, um, that plantings of the landscaping, you know, we propose a, um, uh, you know, a maintenance program that we're going to have a landscaping firm uh, manage for us. If and when there is any issues with any of that planted vegetation, it will be replaced as needed. We actually have firms that we hire to um, to do routine um, inspections of our facilities, not only for the planted vegetation, but also to maintain the inside and look at any potential, you know, uh, breaches of anything on site. So yeah, we do want to maintain the site. That's, uh, that's and so that's something that we will actually uh, have in our plan. Then, and what about the long term? Long term? I'm yes. sorry. Go ahead. Um, and your question on the long term was whether or not. Um, um, so we we're going to have we're going to maintain the tower for you know we have a five year lease and we're going to have ten additional ones so we plan on keeping the tower for quite some time. If I can add to that, Commissioner, that's a great question. These are big investments as you can imagine not only do we have responsibility under the lease we also have responsibility under your code that if it's abandoned we have to take care of it but it, importantly on top of that we have the relationships under co-location leases these are major commitments by national companies like sci to t-mobile so there are multiple layers to protect that uh, this investment and again, your code provides that if the tower is quote abandoned, in other words, it goes fallow, their responsibility is to have that mitigated and removed. Thank you. That was a, that was a major question. I didn't want to just left there. So thank you very much. I understand. Um, thank you for uh, the question. Yeah, Suzanne, I did also just want to mention. So the um, the proposed year 
long um, irrigation that they're talking about with the uh, the weekly checkups to rewater and do the self water systems. That is picture that the plants get established. They did um, pick and had a landscape architect uh, sign off that these are naturally occurring plants that are drought resistant. So they should be able to last with minimal maintenance. That's the reason that these plants specifically were chosen for this area. Thank Laura, you, Laura. Laura, can I ask mm -hmm. a follow up to that? Was the reason they're doing this because it was difficult to get water to that site, which is why they're going with a, a low impact landscape plan? Um, I, I'm not sure about water availability because the restaurant is there. Um, however, they did not want to install a, an electronic um, automatic irrigation system with the water. They wanted to do the um, naturally occurring so that they did not have to uh, uh, pay for an irrigation plan. Mr. Chairman, this is Doug. Just quick comment, uh, if I could. Uh, one of the things I did want to mention uh, w whether CUP or a standard site, uh, the, the standard code requires that any landscaping planted as a part of it must be maintained. So that's a, that is a standard code requirement that, that would come into play if we did have some issues uh, on landscaping. Uh, just want to mention that just for the record only. And I think everything else was covered. Thank you, Doug. Andy, any questions or comments? Yes, thank you, uh, and congratulations on the uh, chairmanship. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got several. Um, I was trying to view from the plans how far away the tower was from the Live Oak Grill restaurant, one of our uh, local favorite eateries. I do not know in feet how what that distance is. I, I apologize for not knowing that. Um, but um, the drawings are to well, scale. Hold, hold on, I've got Google Earth open. I'll get it for you in a second. Okay. Okay. The, the concern is the proximity to uh, where we'd be sitting outside eating. Um, I see just quick search that we want to be a good 150 meters away from that where we have people congregating. That's why I asked the question. It's about 360 feet roughly to the closest um, part of the restaurant. Okay, so it's about 150 feet short of where the usual recommendations are from people congregating around the cell tower. Is that right? I'm just I'm doing some quick searches. Um, this is this is uh, minimum safe distance. Doug, can you cell answer phone. that? I'm not sure what um, congregating. That's cell not that's not part of the city city code here. Um, yeah. Okay. That's not um, a standard city code. I didn't think it was. Okay. Okay. So we've got an issue with our city code. We probably need to address at another meeting, um, especially as we expand our cell tower uh, coverage. But that is a little close to where people would be gathering, isn't it? Well, keep in mind too, um, Andy, that it's 130 feet in the air. So you really need to measure along the diagonal. Uh, I understand the American Cancer Society says it needs to be 150 meters away from where people are. So that's that's why I asked the question. We have a I'm cell tower next to Imperial Park where the girls play softball. It's not that far. I know. I don't like that one. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I need to, to, to state something for the record, uh, especially for Commissioner Schultz here. One of the things that the FCC prohibits us and, and in the code from consideration is any electromagnetic fields or anything in the siding of these. We're not able to discuss that that any further on this. Okay. Uh, legal may have some additional comments on that, but I, we, we need to. to. Okay. Um, the next question, is this a 5G tower or is this uh, one of the older towers? This uh, That's a great question. It comes off often. The tower itself is steel. The 5G is a product of the various carriers as they develop their systems. So when we hear often, it's a very common question. I appreciate the question. The tower itself is not considered 5G. It's as the demand and the systems technology changes, it's up to each of the carriers uh, to install the appropriate equipment that they need to resolve their gaps. One quick point on that, these are highly regulated industries, as you can imagine. Uh, and wireless carriers like T-Mobile, Verizon, AT&T, have strict standards that they have to follow. 
they're regulated and they have to broadcast, if you would, using a colloquial term within the spectrum that's granted. So going back to your original question, 5G doesn't relate to the actual structure that my client SCI is installing. Okay. I heard a couple of times three additional cell towers. Is that three additional masks that will hang on this tower or is that three additional poles? No, sir. I may have misstated. It's three additional carriers can co-locate their antennas like T-Mobile. So they would be at three what we call rad centers. You have T-Mobile at 125, and then as this tower is available for the additional carriers such as Verizon, AT&T, and future carriers, they will come in and locate their antennas at the required rad center that they need. So it will be three to four separate rad centers, not individual towers. Got it. That clears that up. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for the question. How will this tower from T-Mobile impact city residents and travelers of other carriers? It won't. That's another great question. They all have been granted particular spectrum, and they're regulated to transmit, if you would, within their spectrum. It's very common. In fact, multiple of the towers in your community, I'm sure, have multiple co-locations already on them. So it's a highly regulated industry with each carrier having their required spectrum. All right. I was trying to go through the plans, and this is where we're going to really miss Carl. I was trying to figure out how this was illuminated. It's not. It's not to a height, and Dennis, chime in if you would, please. But we've received the FAA no determination hazard, which means it does not need to be lit. Correct. So this tower would not be illuminated at all? There will be no lights? That's why there's no photometric plan involved, because there is no lighting. Got it. The FAA files on file for our records that state there was no light needed. Okay. No, fantastic. And then the last question, I'm going to go back to the landscaping question that's come up a couple of times. The buffer that's remaining, is that still, am I reading this right, that that buffer is in the existing property line? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, and I appreciate all the time you put into this. Thank you. Well, thank you for your questions. Thank you, Andy. Jay, any questions, comments? Yes, sir. Thank you. You know, nobody wants a 130-foot tower in their backyard, but, you know, this is a fairly decent location in my mind, being in the Sugar Land Business Park area. But I would like to direct counsel to the 11 by 17 sheets Z5, the antenna and tower elevation details. Mr. Francis mentioned that eight-foot fence was going to shield or hide or screen, and I'm paraphrasing, most or all of the ground equipment. Well, notice the top of the canopy is 11 foot, eight inch above ground level, three point or three foot, eight inches above the fence. You know, eight-foot fence is a pretty tall fence, so I wouldn't propose, you know, anything much taller, but that leads me to the landscaping. I'm in favor of sticking with our typical CUP requirements or our historical CUP requirements where we have a four-inch caliper live oaks and we have 36-inch space shrubs and preferably double road. That way, when you've got one or two of those shrubs die over years, you've got double row of those shrubs to account for that. 
I'd also be uh, in favor of putting those along the east side. That that existing brush along that property line, we don't know who owns that. We don't know who's going to clear that out. Uh, that could be gone next year. Um, the neighbor of the east might own it and decide to clean that out. So I would suggest wrapping the whole fence with a double bank row of shrubs on 36 inch centers and four inch trees. Also, uh, there's no, I didn't see anywhere in the plans where they mentioned the caliper trees. It's, it's written in the staff report, but I didn't see on the- it's, Yeah, it's in the chart. Um, it's okay. on the slide that shows the overall landscape plan. Uh, there's a chart at the top that mentions the uh, caliper and height. Okay, perfect. Well, I'd be in favor of, of sticking with our historical CUP landscape requirements and including including that on the easterly fence line. That's all I had. Thank you. Commissioner, if I it might address your comment, I appreciate it. First uh, of all, we have a lease area and to do a double stacking of landscaping is going to be very difficult. Also to maintain, we have 25 feet with one landscaping bed and then go to another 20, you know, width of a double stack, as you called it, of landscaping. So because of the placement of this site, um, we would respectfully request that we stay with one, as you call layer, or you would bed of landscaping. The also the rear portion of the, as you call the east portion, uh, if we go to Google Earth shot, it backs on to the rear of commercial properties. So it's, we, I would, so if it was backing on a residential, I, I think that I can really appreciate the concern, but this is existing. It's gone through a staff review and I don't know who would be impacted if there was some detriment to the existing foliage. So, um, we would respectfully request that maybe we have a discussion about that. And thank you for your comment, Mr. Francis. Uh, Dan, I'm sorry, Jay, I think you said you were finished, correct? Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Yeah, I have, I have a couple of questions. Um, first of all, even though this is about three and a half miles from the airport, is there, is the FAA requirements been met in terms of, uh, yes. Flight mm -hmm. paths and so forth? Yes, they have been. Okay. Um, secondly, are there any, you know, security concerns in facilities like these? I mean, it's it's not lit. It's in the back of this restaurant parking lot. Um, you know, are, is it is it pretty fortified if someone was to get past the fence? Uh, Commissioner, that's a great point. A lot of times, and we're finding more often, in this situation, uh, we're doing a board on board fence uh, to obscure the, the view into the compound. Right. A lot of jurisdictions have gone away from that and want either a chain link fence with an anti climbing device simply for the question you asked. But because of the, the way that uh, the code and working with staff, the view to have to go ahead and do the board on board fence that would obscure the view. Mm -hmm. um, they are locked. They are clearly locked. They are given only uh, access to the carriers and uh, security, obviously, with the amount of the equipment uh, being critical infrastructure uh, is a very, very important issue. But I did want to make that point that mm -hmm. more and more jurisdictions, uh, and you may look to that if you do code modifications, are considering more of a compound such as the chain link with an anti-climbing device. Yeah. Um, I take it this facility is not staffed. I mean, there's no traffic on a daily basis. That's correct. correct. Uh, again, thank you for the question. It's unmanned, no wastewater or water facilities. On an average, uh, a facility like this, fully loaded with the antennas, will have one truck maintenance trip per month. In other words, come out, check the equipment, uh, make sure that the electronics are fine. Um, so it's a very, that's why usually there are no traffic impact analysis ever required because of the limited uh, uh, need to traffic to the, uh, to the facility. 
Okay. Uh, last question, and it really resulted from the comment that the, it won't, the area won't be eliminated. Does this mask at least have a light at the top for FAA? No? Not no, a flashing no. beacon? Nothing? No, sir. It was, that was not required by the FAA report. Okay. That's all I have, Matt. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Dan. And to be clear on that last point, did I hear you correctly, Mr. Francis, that you obtained a letter or certificate from the FAA indicating that no lighting yes. is required yes. in, in light yes. of the tower's proximity to the regional airport? Staff does have that report uh, on file. Okay. And then again, walk me through and walk me through a little bit why the fencing that's proposed for this has been chosen as opposed to what you mentioned Mr. Francis has done in some other jurisdictions with the chain link and the anti-climbing. And I'm particularly interested in knowing whether or not right. so, there is going to be any anti-climbing implementation on this site or does the site not lend itself to that kind of a technology for lack of a better word. So if I may just for a moment, um, chain link fence is actually not allowed in the city of Sugarland in this area. So that is why there is wood because we do require a solid fence. Um, as to the anti-climbing, I do not know if that can be put on a wood fence or not. It's it's somewhat difficult because of the support of it to put uh, barbed wire, but um, yeah, absolutely it's the code requirement that there not be in this jurisdiction, but maybe something that you wanna take into consideration because of a lot of public safety uh, officials really do want to be able to come in, look in, and see what's going on. Particularly, and it becomes less intrusive if you do have landscaping like we're proposing, that does tend to soften the chain ring uh, look and again, provide that digital access. Okay, thank you. Uh, those are all the questions. Any other questions or comments from the commission? I've got one more, Matthew. And it's just a comment to Mr. Canine's note earlier on the double row of landscaping. If you look at Z3, it appears that all of the landscaping is outside the lease area um, itself. So I don't know how the lease area. Um, actually, uh, if I can point, uh, there's actually the fence is only 48 feet. So there, ex that extra two feet outside of it is where the single row of landscaping is going. Okay. Well, that explains the thing because the drawing doesn't, doesn't seem to show that. So thank you for that, Laura. Mm -hmm. One, one last, um, clarification, um, uh, Mr. Francis, I, I believe, or maybe, uh, Laura, you said it during your presentation. Um, as, as, as the tower is populated with other antennae, uh, will they each, will each, uh, have its own small footprint building like this one in each of the remaining three corners? Did I hear y'all say that? Great question again, Commissioner. It depends on each carrier. Okay. If, if you recall back, gosh, in the nineties, you would see the big equipment shelters, we call them. Now the carriers are going to smaller equipment and on what we call equipment racks, but it will be up to each equipment uh, design that the uh, particular carrier um, requires. But in your estimation, this site is is well suited to, you know, facilitating that in the future. For uh, yes, sir, absolutely. And it is uh, obviously a desire both of uh, the community and SCI to get the tower uh, co-located on to cut down on the proliferation of towers. Dennis and the team designed the size of the compound to be able to accommodate the total number of carriers. So Laura or Doug, it, it is, uh, will this CUP be subject to revision each time we get a new layer, you know, group, group of no. antenna? No, um, because the, the CUP does include that other antenna, it'll be done administratively. Okay. Yeah, Thanks. that's correct. Uh, Mr. Uh, Laura, I, I'd like to yes. go back to that question about the 50 foot. Um, if you look mm -hmm. at Z3, the way it's dimensioned, um, I forget who just made that comment, but they are correct that that at least on, on Z3, the vegetation is outside of the 50 foot area that might be incorrect dimensions on that sheet in which case uh you can add that as a condition to fix that um 
It's right. also incorrect on Z2 then. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So is that Z2 and Z3 that we think that the, de the uh, dimensions may not be correct? And L1. The trees would clearly be outside. Of yeah. The, and the, the trees, and are, the trees clearly are clearly outside. Clearly yes. outside. Yeah. I don't know if that was part of it. Commissioner, if I may, if I'm looking at Z2, uh, it calls out at the top of Z2, sorry for the scratchy voice, um, new 48 by, excuse me, uh, 48 by 48 um, SCI wood fence compound within new 50 by 50 uh, lease area. So the compound itself, is going to be 48 by 48, leaving that two inch, um, a two, excuse me, two foot um, landscaping bed within the lease area. So then the dimensioning is just incorrect on the drawing. We will certainly correct that. I'll look into that. Thank you for catching it if it is off. Okay, hearing no further discussion, would anyone like to make a motion at this time? Matthew, I have one question. Are, are, we, moving, are we moving to approve a recommendation with the modification to landscaping for the wax myrtles on 36 inch centers and the, the four inch calipers, uh, live oak trees? Are we moving forward to recommend without that? Well, good question. We don't have a motion yet. So uh, if, if, if it looks like a majority, the, the commission would like to approve that, but we've got to have a motion first. So I'd do like I to hear a motion? motion? All right, I'll go ahead, motion. Suzanne. Uh, I move to recommend with the modification to landscaping with the wax myrtle hedges on 36 inch calipers and a four inch um, uh, live oak tree and the, con and the changes to Z2 and Z3, is that correct? I think it's Z as in Zorro. Yeah. Um, you can just say um, wherever necessary. Just okay, wherever right. necessary. Uh, for approval. Approval to city council. All right, yes. so let me let me let me see if I can restate if I can make sure I understand what the current motion is. If you'll give me just a second to get a little bit more organized. All right, so what I'm hearing, Suzanne, you are making a motion to recommend approval of the proposed conditional use permit for the 130 foot tall T-Mobile monopole communications tower uh, on approximately 2,500 square feet located on the rear of the property at 12935 Dairy Ashford Road that we've been discussing this evening with the following modifications. Your proposed conditions are the use of, and go ahead and state those again, and I believe it's the use to have the landscaping that meets our traditional CUP requirements, specifically the use of a four inch caliber trees and 36 inches of spacing for the shrubs. Is that right? It is. And then, and then the other condition would be to uh, revise the exhibits to reflect the appropriate dimensions uh, for, the, for the proposed site and for the proposed permit. Yes, sir. All right, I've got that motion. Is there a second? I'll second. I can't let that uh, new hairstyle go on uh, unseconded. Love okay, it. We, we have a motion for recommendation by Commissioner Watley and a second from Commissioner Ushold. If you'll vote at this time. No discussion. Any further discussion? I didn't think we had any, but. Uh, what about the east side? There's two feet of space. Can we not amend the motion to include landscaping along the east side? All right, again. We, we actually only have one foot on each side, not two. Well, he, the, so Francis said there was two feet and it was an well, area. If it's 50 by 50 and the fence is 48 by 48, you have a foot on each side. That won't allow a double row of, of hedges. Good point. My my bad math. It could catch. Thank you. But we're talking about just adding it to the fourth side, not double rows. Correct. Right. I was uh, adding it to the east side to complete enclosure of screening. I thought the motion was for the perimeter. 
not the case, Suzanne? Yes, we'll add yes. Okay, so hold on. So do we want to add, do we want to add an additional condition that the, uh, that the applicant consider adding landscaping to the east side of the proposed area? Can we do that? Can we do that? Please add the, add the entire uh, parameter, perimeter of the, add the entire perimeter around it with the landscaping on three inch centers, four inch live oak trees and correct Z2 and Z3 as needed. 36 inch centers. I'm sorry, 36 inch yeah. centers, yes. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I think we've correctly stated that before. We're now adding Commissioner Canine's suggestion of the addition of, of appropriate landscaping to the east side yes. of the site, correct? Correct. All right. Is, that's there, some, that's is there some discussion before the vote? Because well, I, 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 Okay. We've had plenty of discussion. The answer is yes. But I want to make sure we've got a motion and we've got a second. Can yes, we... I still second. Uh, All right. I can't let it go. All right, very good. So now we've got a motion and a second, and now I will call for any further discussion. So, uh, Mr. Francis or or um, Laura, so if we require that extra row of of hedging or additional hedging on the east side, does that have enough distance to the existing vegetation or would some of the existing vegetation there have to be cleared? Um, um, I'm just looking at the Google Earth image and there's yeah. uh, there's existing so the, vegetation that's fa fairly close. Yeah, so there would already be some clearing occurring because of the new fence going up. So I do believe that after that clearing occurred, there could be room for a single row of hedges. I'm not okay. sure about double row, um, but I do believe because they do have to clear some for the fence, there should be room for the hedges. If, okay. if I may, because, Commissioner um, Laura, uh, Dennis, um, is the is there sufficient through your sidewalk? Will that create an issue having to put a row of landscaping along the east side? Can you unmute and address that? Yeah, I, I did uh, visit the site a couple of weeks ago and on the east side of that uh, proposed compound, there there's quite a bit of vegetation. So we're gonna be removing quite a bit of smaller of uh, the hackleberry tree, I believe is what it's called. And, and it's pretty tall, pretty tall. And so it would uh, create some other issues possibly because on that back side of that property, I believe there is, um, you, you know, some other issues when it comes to the uh, sheet flow off of that with the water flow off of that um, plant property from the back. So that would uh, also possibly be an issue. Um, I would also mention that um, because that existing vegetation would not be codified in the CUP, uh, the current property owners could come in and clear it off and be completely in their legal rights to do that, and there would be no vegetation. So adding that row of screening does codify a required single row of hedges. Um, just a, a statement there for the record. Um, and I do believe we have engineering on if um, I, I'm not sure about sheet flow uh, drainage issues, but uh, engineering might be able to answer that. Who do we have on from engineering? Yeah, G uh, Guillermo. I'm here. Yeah. Guillermo. Guillermo Salcedo, go ahead, please. Hey, uh, I have to go take a look at the site. Honestly, uh, I don't see I don't see a lot of problems with the sheet flow. Uh, it's, if, if they start removing a lot of the dirt there, and then they might create something. But if they're gonna clean up a little bit, I don't think any any there will be any issues with that. But I'll, I'll have to go out there and take a look, a closer look, and see. But I can't I can't really say uh, there's gonna be something changing there. All right, thank you, Guillermo. Okay, any further discussion? All right, we've got a motion and second if you'll vote at this time. Where did, well, it happened again, Lisa. <laughs> Uh, it was here when we began, and the first first vote. Uh, I'm voting nay, so 
You can put that in the file. I got it. Thank you. Okay, and I saw it and disappeared, but I believe the mo the motion passes. It did. Yeah. Yes, sir. There it is. And Dan, you did vote for the motion, just for the record. You said no. yay, right? You I voted said nay. nay. Okay, so, nay. Well, so so what we saw on the screen was not correctly Incorrect. reported. Yes. You're, you're voting against, and the motion still yes. passes. Yeah. All right. All right, thank you, everyone. We'll go on to the next agenda item, which I believe is item seven, reports. Planning and Zoning Commission liaison reports for the City Council meeting for September the 8th, September the 15th, October 6th, and October 20th. Who had the September meetings? Perhaps that is one of our commissioners that is not with us tonight, Commissioner Landine, perhaps. Did anyone have to the September 15th meeting? I had September 15. I don't know if I have it with me and I apologize. I was out of town. I watched it, but yes, I do. I have it with me. I'm sorry. On, All second. right. Go ahead, Suzanne. Uh, the 15th. Nope. Nope. I don't have a September 15th. I'm sorry. Okay. No worries. Uh, does anyone have a report from the October 6th meeting? Chairman, I do. Um, I've got October 6th and the 20th. Uh, so the sixth meeting, um, nothing really consequential for us. They approved um, some mud bonds and the imperial redevelopment um, ordinance that, I, that, that we had, that had talked about in one of our meetings. So that was unanimously approved um, in the October 6th meeting. Um, in the October 20th meeting, um, council um, handled all the appointments and the um, including our commission and, and the other commissions that have new members. So um, that was a big part of the meeting. Um, the one item of note for us that I think is relevant is uh, Rick Ramirez, our intergovernmental relations manager, gave a pretty lengthy presentation on some of the legislative priorities that they're gonna be tackling and focusing on. And one of the things that came up was the, the city's um, support of repealing possible 2439 which relates to uh, building materials and giving more, giving uh, cities and municipalities more direct control over uh, what building materials can and can't be used in, in, in development. So they're, they stressed um, the fact that they would be uh, in support of repealing that, of, of, and repealing that bill. So um, that, was, that, that was a good presentation that Rick gave. Um, but other than that, I don't really see anything else terribly consequential to PNZ in that meeting, but um, I did honor Bill, Coach Bill Yeoman. So as a U of H alum, I was um, <laughs> kind of cool to see that. Uh, they had a, a, a honored him with giving him Bill Yeoman Day on the ceremony. Um, so that was a, a nice gesture on the city's part. So uh, the, other than that, Chairman, that was, uh, those, were, those were my comments and reports. Thank you, AP. Yeah, that was really a good catch too on the legislative report. Um, I've, been, I've been very impressed. Uh, and I actually served on the legislative task force for the city. And it is really, truly amazing uh, that in this era that we have in the state of Texas of individualism, that there's such a, there's such a disconnect between the state and the local locality. So I'm glad to see the city of Sugarland uh, asserting its case for local control over things that the localities know best, in my humble opinion. Uh, moving on to the next item, 7B city staff report. Just really quickly. Uh, Hold on just a second, Doug. Jay, are you trying to say something? If so, you're on mute. Unmute, I'm sorry. Thank you. I'm glad there you go. That. I just wanted to add that September 8th was the second Tuesday. It should have been a city uh, PNZ meeting that was canceled. So I, I, we might check with the city secretary's office on that. That might be a type of. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jay. Okay, 7B. Doug, what do you got? Okay, yes, sir. Uh, we'll keep this real brief. Uh, don't uh, have anything uh, uh, big to report right now for a year, but your next meeting, November, should be November 10th. And again, we normally will just have one meeting in November uh, due to the Thanksgiving holidays, unless we had a timing on a plat we'd have to do. But 
right now, the, the main item we know for sure will be, as Ruth mentioned, uh, we're going to have the commission uh, uh, hear the workshop on the annual master plan reports, get a chance to, to, to get a deeper dive into those. Uh, it is possible we might have a subdivision plat uh, for you, but uh, that's all we know at this wow. time. So, yeah. <laughs> Doug, let me ask you, I think this was mentioned at the council meeting on Tuesday, but is there a date certain for the uh, honoring for Carl and Kathy yet? Is that on the calendar? Do you know? I think Lisa has an answer on that. Yes, I believe we are we are honing in on November 17th, the city council meeting on November 17th, but okay. we can analyze that and definitely let you all know. Excellent. We do not want that to slip by unnoticed. Great. All right. Thank you very much for the reports. Thank you everyone for your patience and perseverance on a meeting. Welcome again to our new commissioners. Thanks to everyone on city staff who, who reported and conducted the training sessions. Very grateful for your time and service. Is there a motion to adjourn? We'll move. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Uh, motion to adjourn by Commissioner K-9. Seconded by Commissioner Ushold. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a good hey, night. Lisa. Lisa. We are adjourned. I, I found my, blo my voting thing. It was behind Google Earth. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. We'll see y'all. We are adjourned. Thank you. Good night.